please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Porter County Board of Commissioners Tuesday, June 13th, 2023 meeting. We'll start with the consent agenda. Approval of payroll, May 26th and June 9th, 2023. Approval of claims, May 24th, June 1st, June 8th, 2023. Approval of minutes for May 23rd, 2023. Weights and measures monthly report. April 16th to April 15th, May 15th, 2023, five. Entertain a motion. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Memorial Opera House. Scott Mc... Oh. Good morning. Good morning. We have an artistic services agreement. Season 2024, show four at $12,520. Can we do these together, Scott? Yes. Okay, and then we have uh, their second is season 2024, show five at $8,866.22. Is there anything before we vote? Is there anything you'd like to add? or? No. Nope. I'm not supposed Good. to talk about them. You didn't even have to be here, see? <laughs> I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank hey, you. Hey, Natalie, what, yeah. can you give us a brief update on the Penguin Project? Oh, sure. Okay. So um, we have over 70 kids, a part of the production already signed up, so that's exciting. We recently um, secured the a therapy dog as Sandy. For those of you who are familiar with the story of Annie, there's a dog in that show. It shows Annie. Annie. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, now everybody knows it's Annie. Oh. Um, so <laughs> the, the dog is a therapy dog, so we're excited to work with that animal. Auditions are tonight, and everyone does get a part, so that's going to be fun. And uh, Scott told me that recently we secured the funding for a temporary stage and a, and a lighting rig at the Boys and Girls Club, so they get to perform on a stage. Oh, great. Yeah. Right, thank you. That's exciting. And each of those kids has a mentor, right? So that's a Stadium. lot of people. Doesn't every kid have a mentor? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thanks. Uh, commissioners, uh, we have a repeal ordinance number 13-06, an ordinance creating a non-reverting fund for receipt of charitable donations for Porter <coughs> County Central Communications, the second reading. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve on second reading. Second. We have a, a, a motion and a second to approve uh, ordinance, a uh, repeal of ordinance number 13-6 an ordinance creating a non reverting fund for receipts of charitable donations for the Porter County Central Communications. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Uh, opiate discussion. Um, Marine House. Um, I just would like to invite all four of our presenters to at least come and sit up in front here, and then we'll do these in order. Just to give everyone a perspective, um, Porter County has received a certain amount of money over the next 18 years, and we are going to be spending 160,000 of that each year. And we have, uh, we're going to be discussing today the expenditure of 50,000 of those dollars for this year. Uh, Councilman Greg Sims and I have been working on this project since January. And we're very excited that we have four of our recipients today to talk about the projects. And hopefully, at today's meeting, we will give approval for these projects. And at our evening meeting this month, we'll have a resolution, which we can then forward on to the council for funding. And do we have a representative here from Moraine House? Hi, my sir. Hi. And no. uh, do we have a representative from 320 Recovery? That's you. The Juvenile Detention Center, I know that's you. And Portage Recovery. Yes, sir. Thank you. You can start first, sir, if you'd like. Do you want to come in? So basically, if you just want to give a little bit of information about Moraine House and the project that we are hoping to fund for you. Well, um, appreciate the opportunity to be here, first of all. Um, Moraine House has been around since 1975. 
Um, it started off as a 30-day program, and now it's evolved into a six-month program um, where we treat alcoholism and addiction. Um, being around that long, plus the house that we're in, is I'd say that house is probably around 100 years old. And we do the best that we can off of client fees and grants, but we just don't have enough to do everything that we need to do around the house. Um, I was asked to put a list together after our first meeting, and I put kind of a wish list together of like projects that we're going to need done. And um, I did have a conversation with uh, Mr. Sims as well. And um, what we, the number one priority as far as a to help us constructually is that we need a new roof. Um, we do we do not have it's leaking. We do not have the money in the budget to do that. So that's kind of what we focused on for this, and um, we very much appreciate the help because that just takes any kind of extra funding. We have to go find somewhere, and um, and you know just you know personal opinion. We've been dealing with the opioid crisis, you know, all this time. So you know, I I think that uh, we're very deserving of of funding via the settlement. And our recommendation is $10,000, and their estimate came very close to that yes, $10,000. So thank you so much. Did you just want to give your name, please? Michael O'Connor. I'm the executive director. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Very good. Can we vote for all of these together, or do we, should we be voting on each of them individually, Scott? Oh, I would probably do these individually. Okay. okay. Uh, do we have a, a motion? Of some type, Bart? I move that we uh, allocate $10,000 for the roof repair of Moraine House. Do I have a second? Yeah, a second. Is that, do, how does this work with council? Council has to approve, too. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second <coughs> to, uh, to allocate uh, $10,000 of, uh, of ARP funds. No, no, no. Opioid. Opioid, oh, opioid I'm sorry, opioid. <coughs> Uh, o opioid funds uh, to the Moraine House uh, for the purpose of repairing their roof. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. So this will now go to this will now go to our county council, which is the fiscal body has to have the last approval. Well, one thing that one more step is Scott will put together a resolution with everything that we approved today, and that will be presented at our next commissioners meeting, okay. which will then go to the council. Uh, 320 recovery. It's hard to hear. Thank you. Okay. Um, so 320 Recovery is seeking funds to uh, support the salary of a recovery coach. Um, so what we are is a, a nonprofit recovery community organization. Uh, we are certified through DMHA, um, so Division of Mental Health and Addictions. Um, I think we've all seen, you know, the, the increase in the impact of the opioid epidemic um, and the need for services, um, both treatment and recovery, is very great. Um, and so, again, we are asking for funds to um, support the um, a part or a full-time recovery coach. We have already um, gotten the uh, confirmation that the state will be providing matching funds, um, just pending the outcome of this. And what is the amount of money you're requesting? Uh, Ten thousand dollars. So the state is providing forty thousand. Chesterton <coughs> from their opioid funds is uh, providing ten thousand, and we're hoping to provide ten thousand. They had to have uh, the state required uh, a matching grant, mm -hmm. and yes. it had to come from the opioid funds. It couldn't come from any other source. Yes. So. And both uh, Commissioner Biggs and I attended um, one of your events there, and we are very impressed with your operation and what you're doing for the community, so thank you. Thank you. And so I move to approve a $10,000 allocation for 320 recovery. Second. I have a motion to approve $10,000 allocation of opiate funds to, the re to uh, 320 recovery uh, to, for the uh, hiring of a recovery coach. Did I get that right? Yes. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Christine Paul. Thank you. Juvenile Detention Center. It's your turn. <coughs> Okay. 
Um, I'm Allison Cox, and I am the director of the Juvenile Detention Center here in Porter County. Um, we have two projects that we would like to have funded. One is a prevention project, and the other one is an intervention project. The first one, I just gave you a, a handout in regards to Juvenile Justice Jeopardy. This is a program that we have been performing for the youth involved with our system for several years now. There's different modules. Um, that you can actually create for your community through Strategies for Youth. It's a nationwide um, agency that actually works on relationships between juvenile justice, law enforcement, and youth. Um, the big thing that we've been doing with Juvenile Justice Jeopardy, it, it is exactly what it sounds like. It is the game Jeopardy. Um, we've been mainly working with youth um, involved with our system, but we also have done this program in Valpo schools and in Doonlin schools. We do want to expand it to the Boys and Girls Clubs and all of the other school districts. Um, the, the game that we have right now, it has taken, a, it taken it, it's old. <laughs> it needs to be upgraded, we need, and plus I would also like to do some new modules. And we also would like to update the modules to do more substance abuse specific categories in regards to the law and what can happen. Um, so we're actually working on that process right now. So that is the, that's the first project. The second project is doing a mentor program for our highest risk youth on our caseloads in the juvenile justice system. Now these would be our problem solving courts. We do have three problem solving courts right now, our juvenile and family drug court, our truancy court, and our mental health court. Um, the mental health court and our, well, I will say all three of our courts, um, we are dealing with substance abuse with pretty much 95% of the families involved with those three courts. Um, and as well as with our intensive probation caseload. Those are the highest risk kids as well. Um, like I'll quote uh, uh, for, you know, uh, the late Judge Harper in regards to these are the kids that have one foot on a banana peel and the other one on the bus to DOC. You know, those are the highest risk kids and, and probably 95% of them also have substance abuse issues. Um, the problem is, is that we really don't have a lot of mentors out there for kids. And so I know that if we're able to have some type of funding in order for recruitment, um, in order to pay for, for programs, for some type of activities for these youth, that we can take a kid to the movie, we can take them fishing, we can work with different agencies throughout the community to link these kids together, um, that's what we would also like to use regarding these funds. And we are recommending $10,000 for each of those two programs for a total of $20,000. And I move that we allocate $20,000 from the op opioid fund settlement to the JDC for their two programs. Second. We have a motion and a second to allocate uh, $20,000 to the Juvenile Detention Center. Uh, and what, what it, just so everybody's clear, what are the two programs called exactly? Juvenile Justice Jeopardy and Mentor, Mentoring. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed, same <laughs> sign. Motion approved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Portage Recovery. I spent all this time on these flyers. Thanks. Pick up the uh, so my name's uh, Jake. <coughs> my last name's Monhut, M-O-N-H-A-U-T. I feel like I'm in court. I've uh, been the president of the Portage Recovery Association um, for six years. We've been open for uh, over 30. I'm also a member of the recovery community. Um, this a April, I celebrated 10 years. Very grateful. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the idea that we have uh, at the PRA is something that uh, I've seen uh, variations of, uh, kind of like a recovery cafe. I thought the name Sobar was like really fancy and catchy and cool. And um, so the idea would be um, our landlord, where we're at currently, has additional space available in the building and uh, is willing to give us uh, basically 35% off the rent because we're a nonprofit organization. The idea would be to start slow on uh, weekends, maybe five to midnight, and then eventually expand to nights, and eventually expand to have a building that's open uh, from eight in the morning until 10 o'clock at night where anybody in the recovery community can come, get a cup of coffee, get something to drink, shoot pool, hang out, watch the game. Um, there's nothing like that anywhere in the area. Um, I got the idea from different people in recovery that have said uh, they'd seen this in Texas, they'd seen this in Chicago, they've seen this in just other areas. There's nothing like it in Porter County, a place that would be ideally eventually open 24 hours where someone can safe can go to. And 
I always say my one of my biggest dilemmas when I was new is that uh, we're told to you know not go around people, places, and things. You need to can't go to the bars. You can't go with your old friends. And then so we get here, and there's all these people, and they're like, "Well, where are your new friends?" And do what we say. And it's really hard. So to have a place where um, people can just go to and talk, hang out, you know, uh, get something to eat, uh, I think is much needed in the recovery community. Um, the other thing is is that we are on the time crunch with it, unfortunately, because the landlord who's been nothing but great to us. Um, the deal only stands until July 1st. I signed like this dummy lease with him that he's going to hold the facility for us at no charge until July 1st. So if we do get this funding, then we're able to get this great deal. If not, then uh, the deal would fall through and he would open it up to the public again for because he needs to make his too, you know. So it's just a great opportunity and I'm so excited to hopefully share this. And our recommendation is to allocate $10,000. The other reason that uh, I think this is really important for both 320 recovery and for Portage is that the majority of the halfway houses and the resources are in the Valparaiso area. And so it is really important that we provide opportunities and facilities in areas outside of Valparaiso for those in the recovery community. In Portage, we have over 95% of the meetings at our <coughs> facility. There's a couple of meetings at churches throughout the city, but it's 95% us. So I move that we allocate $10,000 to the Portage Recovery Association for their soap bar facility. Second. And that is a cool name. It is. <laughs> we have a motion and a second uh, for the uh, appropriation of $10,000 to the Portage Recovery <clears throat> for the soap bar building. Yeah. Okay. Expansion. Expansion. Expansion of the PRA. <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. And thank you, Barb and Greg Sims, who's not here for doing the work to put this together. These are good choices. Uh, Grimmer Construction pay application number one in the amount of $252,522 for the Valparaiso, Valparaiso uh, Lakes Area Conservancy District. Is uh, anybody here representing them? I saw Dave Hollenbeck earlier. I, it's that's all right. I move there that we approve the pay application number one in the amount of two hundred fifty-two thousand five twenty-two for the VLACD Blackhawk Beach project grant. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. <coughs> all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Pulse Technology Equipment Maintenance Agreement for the mail machine in the admin building in the amount of $1,141.32. We'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve the equipment maintenance agreement for Pulse Tele Technology for the mail machine in our building. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the Pulse Technology and Equipment Maintenance Agreement for the, the mail machine in the admin building in the amount of $1,141.32. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Sheriff's residence lease terms discussion. Okay, and just to recap, we have been discussing leasing out the sheriff's residence. And for those who have missed the conversation, this is the building directly to the east of the Memorial Opera House. It has been vacant since uh, March of 2020, so it's been vacant for over three years. And uh, we are hoping to lease this out. Uh, we did not need to go to the council for approval if we stayed within a three-year lease and under $25,000 in revenue per year. But we did want to make it available to the council should they want us to lease it for a longer term or for a larger dollar amount. Uh, we did meet with the council. They didn't have any, inter any interest in entertaining that conversation. So we are back to our original plan of leasing it for three years for $25,000 or less. Um, at this point, I would like to talk about and get approval to advertise pending a loan from the RDC. We have determined um, in order for us to keep it to the $25,000 or less that we can only lease out the main floor. And uh, having conversations with our facilities director, Daniel Sullivan, and two of our appraisers that that would be $120,000. And so essentially what I'm going to propose today is that we vote uh, 
to advertise this for three years. And actually, I'm not exactly sure what the lease amount is, Scott. It was the average of those two Correct. numbers. That it, was, it was below 25000 It was below 25000 uh, pending the loan from the RDC. Um, and Scott had a really good suggestion is that when we do advertise it, we will advertise it that it will be available on January 1st because we don't want to start any work until we know for sure that we have somebody interested in leasing it. If we do not get that loan from the RDC, and there's no guarantees that we will, then our second option is for us to advertise it as is. In which case, they can't do more than $75,000 in improvements over that three-year period, uh, but they would not, uh, they would, uh, that would now count as their three years in, in the um, as they're doing the renovations to make that habitable. So, any and questions on that? Yeah, I mean, just uh, very quickly, because we, we have a lot here on the, as you right. know, on the agenda, is, is why, why, why have you decided that you wanted to pursue this, this avenue? Well, um, this is, building? well, this is a building that I think is, you know, it's a beautiful building. We still are maintaining uh, the back part of it, which is the old jail as a museum. And I just hate to see that that structure not being used and not being uh, revitalized in any way. I know it's our responsibility, but funding is always an issue. And once we have um, renovated this particular um, building, then we can create a non-reverting fund and have the lease payments go into that non-reverting fund as a perpetual funding mechanism to keep that up to date and in good shape. Because, I mean, right now that building is set vacant for more than three years, I believe it is. Yeah, now. yeah. And, you know, it's deteriorating. And uh, um, there just doesn't seem to be another alternative here without spending, uh, you know, likely millions of dollars to, to renovate it. Um, and for what purpose? Uh, and that, that purpose would, would be debated till, you know, the end of the year. Uh, well, the like, alternative is to do our original MOH plan. Right. And that was uh, at, at last projected an eight point five million dollar choice. Um, so. Um, so I move that we advertise for lease the sheriff's residence for three years for the average of the two appraisals that we got, pending the loan of one hundred and twenty thousand dollars from the RDC. And not receiving that, then I move that we advertise it as is for three years uh, with uh, leaseholder improvements not to exceed $75,000. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. For discussion. Sure, yeah. go ahead. Um, talking to the council, they had asked me today to ask you two to get a bid for the the current MOH expansion so they can compare it to what is proposed. And it seems like all of this needs to happen at the same time to me because if, I mean, if you two are dead set against doing the expansion, then it's irrelevant. But <clears throat> I don't think the council is. I think they still are entertaining that and they, they just want to see what they're looking at. And I know they've Jeremy's talked to you. I know Jeremy's tried to talk to you, but you've been too busy. So I, I'm not ready to I vote see the this. sheriff's residence as independent of the MOH. I don't see that the two are connected. And anyway. is there any way, I mean, you talked about moving um, the Opera House employees over to the courthouse where they can't access their offices in the evening. Why can't they have the upstairs? It's not, it's not finished. I mean, we have to renovate it first. It's not even going to be available until we can fix it. And the courthouse, we have <coughs> the ability to move them in, and hopefully we're going to be but able to... But that needs to be renovated as well. Mm -hmm. It's not ready for them. It, it will be... Uh, well, Daniel will be giving a report on that shortly. So, at any rate, I don't see uh, the MOH and the sheriff's residence as connected in any way. Well, I, you know, I've the courthouse had... and the MOH are certainly not connected in any way. They can't even take their phones in there. Um, 
Well, I've had I've had a couple of discussions with uh, Board President uh, Jeremy Rivas, Council Board President Jeremy Rivas, on the possibility of of uh, you know bid, bidding out the Memorial Opera House renovation along with the expansion, and um, you know I've I you know I've come to the conclusion that I, I think that it's a, a it's a false flag. To the contractors that we would be asking for price when there is there has been no commitment by at least this board to move forward on a project that that's got size and scope and and I just want to make clear my stance on this has not changed a bit in two years and that is the only reason and I am not in favor of doing that project is because of the cost of it it is and I don't believe given our, our current circumstances of buildings that need our attention right now, which is the garage, which is uh, the jail. And I, you know, this, this building needs money. I, the juvenile detention center needs, needs uh, 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 you know, some, some attention. I just, I, I, I think that, you know, throwing, you know, eight and a half to $9 million on a building that we don't utilize to deliver our, any of our services up, I think is irresponsible. So we, but we do have, there has been $5 million of, of ARC funds set aside um, by the council to, uh, to address what needs to be renovated, what needs to be repaired or fixed in the, in the Opera House, which I'm certainly willing to do, um, support. Um, and I, I think that's a pretty good deal if you're throwing $5 million in any, any one of our buildings. I, I don't, I don't. I don't see that as a booby price. So no, we have a motion and a second. We have a lot of things that we need to work with the council on, and this is important to them. Well, yeah, yeah it's also, and I believe that, I believe that my stance on wanting, to, uh, you know, supporting five million dollars to be rent, uh, used in that building is stepping out in the middle of the road. What I would appreciate at this point is not being run over when I'm doing it. Because I believe meeting that's meeting them halfway. That's what I'm trying. That's what I'm trying to do, Laura. Okay. That's five million dollars. Exactly, and it's our responsibility. Yes, and, and that's what I'm trying. That's what I'm trying to address. Mm -hmm. Our responsibility over there to fix what's broke. I'm not trying to make a larger program that's already being subsidized by by county taxpayers. Well, I apologize for having a different opinion than you. Well, uh, you don't have to apologize. I just, <laughs> I, I, we, we discussed this issue for the, for, the, for the last four years at nausea. And we have, probably and we have bigger continue. problems in that building. Mm -hmm. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion approved. Scott, Cherry, I saw you here. <laughs> Can I come up? We have a Skillman proposal for construction management service for, for the renovation of the Memorial Opera House. At our, Scott. at our last commissioner's meeting, we voted on a scope for the renovations for the Memorial Opera House, and subsequent to that, we've had a meeting with Skillman and Schmidt, and they have provided uh, construction management services proposals and yeah, from both of them. So I've asked Scott to come and represent both Schmidt and Skillman in this discussion, so in case anyone has questions. I think you can handle it. <laughs> what are the additional um, expenses that we are going to incur with Schmidt since we're changing plans? I did not see a copy of their proposal, <coughs> um, so I'm not sure what their fee is. And The proposed fee is $95,850 for the design of the project. Construction administration would be able to build hourly not to exceed twelve thousand. And they recommend an allowance for reimbursing expenses in the amount of five thousand. So about a hundred thousand. Now a hundred thousand dollars since it was brought up, a hundred thousand dollars is nothing to you know is what? Is it, well it's it's a hundred thousand dollars. And but my my point is, and I th I think that the reason the, the question was asked is that if we change direction here, it's going to cost us a hundred thousand dollars. But if we don't change direction here, it's going to cost us millions. And that's the whole purpose of changing direction. I just wanted to make that clear. 
Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. So, Scott, I was just wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about the project from your perspective. Um, one of the things we did see if there was a possibility of breaking it up into two separate bid packages uh, because the portion that um, Schmidt was going to be working on, the redesign that was going to take longer, and we did want to get the exterior going as quickly as possible, and the majority of that was already designed. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. And how we actually are splitting this up into two different phases so we can get going on and get that, that exterior buttoned up as quickly as possible. Sure. Uh, we, I did give you a uh, budget based on the last meetings that we've had, a range in costs that included the soft costs that will cover both the CM and the architect's fees. We're looking at multiple packages. Uh, haven't really uh, seen the drawings yet for the main scope of the work, but you are correct that the exterior work was bid out, um, I believe, about a year ago. And that included restoration of the masonry and getting some of the exterior work completed early uh, because it's weather sensitive. So our plan is to do the same thing, probably put the same package out and see if there's a couple things that may have been changed that could affect that. But uh, that is the idea. And that should take Schmidt, you know, within the next month or two uh, put the drawings out, follow the statutory process for bidding, open bids, and get started here in late summer, early fall, which would be enough time to at least get the exterior done. Then we'll follow up uh, a couple months after that with the um, regular, the rest of the construction. We'll have to coordinate that schedule, of course, with the events and everything that's going on. So just need to get to work on the design and, and the planning. Now there's there, uh, I mean there's really no guarantee that just renovating, uh, you know, fixing what's broken in the in the Memorial Opera House structure itself, uh, we, we we could exceed the five million that the uh, the bids could come back more than what we have on hand. Well, we hope that uh, the whole plan is, and the whole reason that we go through this process is a series of estimates at various stages of design to make sure that we're designing to the scope uh, and more importantly, the budget. And at those times when we see that we're trending over, we'll come to you and uh, discuss what's driving those costs over. But with the current scope that's proposed, uh, we're confident that the range that we was given uh, will be, uh, will cover those costs. Because I mean, yeah, I mean, and I appreciate, you know, continuing to be very diligent and careful about you're, you know, pursuing that. Uh, I mean, we all know the building needs repairs, and, and it'd be a shame that if we do, we're doing all this work and it only comes back a little more than what we we thought it was going to be, uh, because we're 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 on a path to fix what's broken in that building, and we're going to get there. It's just uh, make sure that we all do on our end what to make sure that it, it doesn't come back and surprise us as to. Yeah. And you had said something about you're preparing different packages. So, okay. Yeah. Two packages. The first package will be to address the exterior, okay. similar to what we were doing uh, the last time around. Those bids, we have a number from about a year ago. We'll have to obviously expect that to be inflated a little bit. And, um, but that number is pretty solid. And then the rest of the um, project will be designed and bid out and scheduled, which is really probably the most uh, precarious part of this project with some of the deliveries on the mechanical equipment and things like that and again coordinating that with the events uh, that the uh, Opera House currently has. Are we foreseeing any issues about you know securing you know like the mechanicals and such? Um, there's issues but we've they've been around long enough that we know how to handle them. Okay. Um, it's not uncommon nowadays uh, the delivery of the materials are keep an eye on that and that kind of dictates where you're going how reliable those uh, dates that are given from the vendors are sometimes not too good but you never know what will happen in the future here and yeah. how things could be impacted again yeah. okay and just to reiterate, um, this was based on the scope that we voted on at our last commissioner's meeting, and there was nothing added to it, and there was nothing subtracted from it. No. Okay. So, 
Scott, do we need a, a motion to approve? Uh, Separately or together? Yeah. You can do them together. I would just uh, add that they're contingent upon, upon uh, council oh, yes. appropriations. Yes. Yeah. I move to approve the Skillman and Schmidt Associates proposals of services for the renovation of the Memorial Opera House pending the $5 million allocation from the council at the June 27th meeting. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank you. Thank you. Facilities, Thanks, Daniel. <coughs> Director. Opening proposals for architectural design professionals to, to support the facilities director in expanding the health department's main office at the admin building. Yes, good morning, Commissioners. So uh, where we are right now, uh, our first mini phase was to, was to provide a small space for the uh, high-speed voting machine. That's what I'll call it. They have a different name. Uh, for the voters' registration folks over at um, the Expo <coughs> Center, and that has been completed. Um, part of the deal was we would give them a new kitchenette over there because we took out some of their space, and those cabinets are being delivered today. So uh, if we call that part of the project, that's almost done as well. Um, the part about the, the courthouse uh, creating some space over there, office space for the um, the offices for the opera house uh, management team uh, is uh, I have proposals for that. We're ready to go on that whenever we're, we get the word to, to approve that. Uh, cost of that's going to be around $4,000. Uh, we, we can, uh, it's, it's a very minor, uh, I would say, small amount of work. We can supplement that work with our own team, our own staff as well, to keep that down. Uh, we'll probably replace some carpet, for instance, in places in there on our own with uh, supply that we already have on hand. Um, the next big if right now is the uh, trying to make the, the uh, voter registration move for late July, uh, which is looking a little hazardous. The, a lot of our, our, our uh, uh, by hazardous, I mean trying to make that deadline. The, uh, a lot of our local contractors are very busy. It's hard to get them to return calls, take a look at projects, that sort of thing. We're working with a local contractor as an, an advisory uh, process for a while. and. Um, and I'm still hoping that he'll be able to come through, uh, but I'm not sure of that yet. So, but even if we're not, we have about 25 linear feet of walls to be able to put in. Uh, we might be able to do that ourselves uh, in a pinch. Uh, for the most part, most of the utilities are there, electrical, HVAC, uh, communication, and all that's there. So it's not yeah, as Yeah, we'll, we'll get into more detail. Let's, let's yeah. move forward to open the proposal. I apologize, well, sure, but no we're just really time crunched here. I'll let you. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm jumping in the wrong thing. That's all right. There were three proposals submitted. The first one from Core Facilities Inc. We'll get it figured out. Well, we know it's sealed. <laughs> Good. Don't ever become a burglar, David. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to worry about to break in the nail. The uh, second proposal is from Shive Hattery, Architectural Engineering. from Cordagon Clark and Associates. Would you say that again? What was that again? The third proposal is from Cordagon Clark and Associates. Cordagon. Mm -hmm. All right. Core facilities, 96850 dollars. Um, sitting here thinking about SB4, whether or not we opt in. 
Well, we could potentially have more staff and more needs than we a Great point. I was actually going to bring that up. Yeah. Right, right. Five Hattery, 97,800. Assuming my, assuming my math is correct, it's broke down into individual phases. Uh, the Cordigan, or however you pronounce it, Clark is 72,500, I believe, plus a 2.9% 2 2 uh, of construction cost for the management fee. So my recommendation would be the commissioners accept these, take them under advisement, so we have an opportunity to review them. I move to accept the sealed bid proposals for the um, health department expansion. And you will we'll take it under advisement. You'll come back to us with your recommendation. we will do. Okay. Yep. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Now, Laura, you brought up a, a, a point. Uh, why don't you, you wanted to you want to explain what you were. Well, if we opt into Senate Bill 4, right. which is not on our agenda, unfortunately, we will have a lot more income. And I know some of the plans that the health department has is for a social worker, and I don't have it in front of me. Potentially other additional staff, so mm -hmm. um, and programs. So I think the space needs that we talked about when we put those RFPs out might not apply. Right. If we opt in, so I think we need to kind of put things on hold. Well, one thing that I had already checked with Daniel on is we talked about breaking that up into two phases. We know for sure that the coroner and veterans is going to be moving out, and so mm -hmm. we still continue with that portion of it. And then we hold off until we know what we're doing with SB4 and their plans, and then we look at their space needs and yes, continue on that. from that yeah. point. It seems reasonable. I mean, I mean, there's there undoubtedly. I mean, if <clears throat> SB SB4 is to be approved by county government, it, I mean, it's going to quintuple their operations budget. Mm -hmm. yeah, it stand to reason that that you know, more people are going to bring more employees in or more programming, which could change the you know. Yes. makeup of, of how all that's laid out eventually right. so very good point point. and since we're um, we're on that subject matter is that the commissioners will be hearing SB4 in our July 24th evening meeting I uh, just want everybody to, to uh, know that uh, that that meeting that particular meeting was selected because it's going to be a very light agenda so we'll we'll have the uh, the time um, just sat and discuss this this uh, very large uh, request so anyway um, I think that's all we need from you okay unless you have something else was there anything else that you wanted to give on the space needs update you were talking about um, possibly voters registration not moving 
at the end of July? Do we have a, a, a new date? As far as a revised date, I'm not willing to throw in the date yet. I think we okay. can still try it. Okay. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just seeing, I'm putting the cautionary flag out there okay. that we may have to push it back a little okay. bit. But okay. this week will be key. Um, if I can get the technology pieces and some people and some interest back, uh, we might still be able to make it. Okay, very good. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Daniel. Uh, Bob Bird, Public Safety. Uh, Commission presentation. Want to add anything to this? Good morning. Good morning. Now he's got the slides up. Uh, good morning. My name's Bob Bird. That's B Y R D, and I'm president and uh, owner of the uh, RBI Group LLC. I'm a retired police officer, and I do. I'm a licensed Indiana private investigator, and I do law enforcement and public safety consulting. Um, first of all, I, I want to salute the commissioners for addressing the public safety issues here in Porter County. Uh, we've talked extensively about that. We can go to the next slide. Um, you've expressed the concern about Porter County's level of emergency uh, services and the preparedness for them. We have 175,000 uh, people currently uh, living in a rapidly growing Porter County. And a need exists to address the foundation, sustainability, and continued quality of public safety. That's a Jim Biggs quote, by the way. So I had to throw that in there because that hits right to the heart of what we're facing. Okay. We, um, we, Collectively, and I got to tell you, there's about a dozen members of our working group here in this room today. Uh, when we got together and we said, uh, what do our emergency services look like today? What will our future demands be for emergency services? And how do the cities, towns, townships, and county pay for the increased demand for police, fire, EMS, 911, EMA, and the coroner's office? Our first meeting was held on Thursday, February 16th at the MAC Center, and the commissioners were seeking feedback and wanting to know the needs of public safety leaders. Uh, the number of initial participants remained small until we were able to determine a purpose and focus of what this group wanted to do. Uh, some of the meeting topics that we touched on were the, uh, and this was collectively uh, gathered from those uh, public safety professionals that were in the room was uh, volunteer firefighters and there's a concern about the availability of volunteer firefighters to respond to weekday calls when most volunteers are at work and as I spoke and interviewed all the police chiefs and fire chiefs and a number of township trustees and other officials um, I, Chief Rob Huffstadt from the Washington Township Fire Department, who's here with us today, he said the issue regarding volunteer firefighting uh, is an epic issue, and it's not only locally, but nationally. Uh, hats off to the volunteer firefighters because of the sacrifices they, they make every day, and they do it for free. And um, volunteerism, particularly for emergency services, is dwindling uh, because that's just not in the DNA of many people today to volunteer, particularly in life-saving occupations. Uh, another topic is the ambulance contract that will come up for discussion next year in 2024, and renewable in 25, and that's with Northwest Health Hospital. Uh, recruiting and retention is a major issue. Of course it is um, with everything in the national marketplace, uh, whether it's uh, flight attendants and pilots, um, police officers, firefighters, everyone is hurting. The building trades are trying to get people to fill these job vacancies. Same thing's applying here in public safety. Uh, and they're experiencing a problem with recruiting and retaining qualified personnel. Portage Police uh, Fire Chief Randy Wilkening is here, and when I was talking with him, he said, those issues for the future are here now, today, and in a big way we need to start jumping on this as soon as we can. Another issue we discussed was mental health and how it relates to the public and public safety personnel. Uh, we talked about salaries, how um, 
Our emergency services are understaffed, and salaries appear to be a driving force in high-stress emergency service careers that demand a 24-7 operation. And then, of course, we're very familiar with the Porter County Sheriff's Department, and the costs continue to climb for them to house inmates and maintain the Porter County Jail. The, uh, when we looked at all the public safety providers in Porter County, we came up with some interesting numbers. There's eight law enforcement agencies in the county that occupy 267 <clears throat> full-time police officers. They have 383 vehicles within their fleets with an annual operating budget of $2.73 million. When we look at the fire department, we see that there's 17 fire departments in the county, 24 fire stations, 166 career firefighters, and then we have to give a nod again to the volunteers. They have 357 volunteer firefighters in Porter County. Those fire departments collectively have 39 engines or pumpers, four aerial ladder or high platform trucks, 19 takers, uh, tankers, and 86 other miscellaneous pieces of equipment. They also have 18 ambulances in their fleet with a $24.5 million annual operating budget. Now, what I did not count when I went through doing these things is a number of fire departments have these cumulative funds for the acquisition of fire apparatus and equipment, but they also have these other innovative funding ideas uh, for uh, in the form of fundraisers, donations, and grants. And that's for the volunteers and how do they uh, sustain their operations. Northwest Health uh, Porter Hospital runs the EMS for the county. They've got four stations with five frontline ambulances that are staffed daily for basically the unincorporated areas of the county. Of course, um, Portage Fire Department and Valparaiso Fire Department run their own EMS, and the town of Bev uh, Burns Harbor has a, an ambulance. The uh, EMS uh, annual operating budget is $9.2 million. We also look at the 911 Center at Porter County Central Communications. They have 36 full-time dispatchers, a $2.9 million annual operating budget, and last year dispatched almost 187,000 calls for emergency services. Porter County Emergency Management Agency, they have four full-time employees, a 314,000 annual operating budget, and the EMA supplies personnel and equipment to the other police and fire departments in major catastrophic events. We look at the Porter County Coroner's Office. They have one full-time person, 12 part-time employees, two vehicles, and 502,000 annual operating budget. And the reason why I put them in there is because they are part and parcel of the whole public safety ecosystem, if you will. Uh, we call them to the death scenes that the police and fire experience. Um, they take that decedent into their care. They order up autopsies. They draw toxicology. Uh, and they determine the legal uh, cause of manner and death for the police and the prosecutors. If we look at the final slide, and this is what I call the big picture, from the countywide perspective, we have 641 full-time employees in public safety in Porter County. The volunteers are 489, with a total pop, uh, public safety personnel count of 1,204 people. They have 560 total pieces of equipment that are located in the county, with a total operating budget for 31 public safety entities at almost $65 million. So as we move forward, um, we're hoping that the uh, county establishes formally a public safety commission. Uh, it's interesting, the, the dynamic and very forward-thinking viewpoints of all of our law enforcement and fire EMS 911 personnel. Uh, proud of them all. They're very much on the ball and um, bring a lot to the table. They know what the future holds. For, for all of these professionals that work in the business. And that is my report.
Bob, have you done anything just to talk about the changes in like even the last 10 years and how the complexity of public safety has actually increased because of the issues and, and the increase in population and the difference in training that's needed and the difference in equipment that's needed? It is, and it's demanding a higher caliber of personnel because, you know, we talk about recruiting and retaining, but we have to equip these people with all types of technology. Those technology costs keep climbing. You know, you look at an officer today, you know, he's, he carries uh, uh, a body armor. He carries a body camera. He has uh, a taser. Uh, he has a stop the bleed kit. He has an AED in his police car. He's got Narcan. He's got everything. And uh, because they're normally the first on the very scene that have to administer these life-saving skill sets, then comes fire, then comes EMS. It's an all hands uh, on board type event. And um, we have a, what we see, a, a large number of retirements that are occurring within public safety. Um, and so how do we fill that void? How do we not only recruit and retain, but reward these people for their professions and keep them uh, long term within our agencies. There's this churning, if you will, uh, within police fire EMS where officers, firefighters, EMS personnel will frequently leave to go to another uh, location, maybe probably many times more money, better benefits, different working conditions, things like that. But we're fortunate here in Porter County that we have the caliber of personnel that we have that make these commitments to protecting our citizens and, um, and potentially risk their lives in doing so. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen in our own county, I think throughout the years, the council has done a good job of, of you know, trying to keep up with the costs associated to what, you know, what, you know, what the, the costs are in a, in a 21st century uh, law enforcement, you know, uh, agency or police department, sheriff's department. Uh, because, it, you know, you just mentioned, you mentioned, you know, the cameras, the, the vests and all that other stuff that less than 20 years ago, uh, you know, most departments, if any, in this county were carrying all that equipment. Well, that equipment costs money. And that equipment also, because it, because it is new equipment, because it has to be uh, operated uh, uh, properly, uh, training has to occur. When training occurs, there's costs that are incurred. Um, but, you know, I, I think, uh, like in our county, the council has done a pretty good job in trying to keep up with it. Uh, they haven't been able to, to keep up with all of it. I mean, as we talked about earlier, we've got a $25 million bill waiting for us in, in, in the uh, the jail that has to be uh, addressed sooner rather than later. Um, and then we, as you talked about, Bob, the what's going on in our township um, uh, volunteer fire departments. And uh, whereas 20 years ago, this county, from from a demographic standpoint, looked looked different than it does today. And it's uh, in that it, you know, we had every time they put a subdivision in the unincorporated area, there, there's there's more burden on on a fire department to service those areas, and I just you know in in this day and age when uh, you know insurance and the cost of raising a family is what it is compared to what it was 20 years ago, you have, have you have of course have, have less young men and women who are willing to risk their life for no compensation, right. uh, uh, you know and, and and to you know to to manage those fire departments. So it's it's. Um, I mean, you can see the wall it's, it's, it's rushing toward. And if we don't step in front of it, and I mean, they're going, it's going to hit the wall. Right. Uh, I, I don't know which township will be the first one to do it, but it, it will happen if we do nothing. You know, and also today's fires, they burn because of the materials that they have. The fires are burning much faster, much hotter. The carcinogens that our firefighters are exposed to puts them at horrific risk long term. And um, so again, you know, we welcome the commissioner's uh, resolution to create a, a public safety commission. And um, 
I think we have the right personnel to help navigate through what will be the best practices and solutions for public safety going forward. Because, as you know, we for the most part, we've talked about resources, the availability of resources. But you know, as being a longtime police, uh, police chief yourself, is that not, not every problem solved by throwing more resources at it. That it's just better planning or, or preparation. And that's what we're, we're trying to understand here. What are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? And, you know, what, what, what can we afford to do and what, what we can't afford to do and why? So uh, I think that's what our residents expect. You know, as a as a elected official, I think public safety has to be our number one concern. I, I don't care who sets up here; it has to be the number one concern. So we know there's a, a problem that we know it's growing, and what we're trying to do with this commission is getting in front of it and, and grabbing it before, you know, it slides off the table. Um, so that is that is why our, I think our first step. Our second step here is to create a public safety commission through ordinance where it has some teeth uh, and, and, and some more direction, um, sort of a blueprint, if you will, um, for its eventual members. So, but thank you so much. You, I really appreciate the work you've done so far. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Could you email us each a copy of what you did today? Yes, I get it. Uh, copies for a whole bunch of you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Great job, Bob. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mac Foundation, Selena Weatherwax, a presentation on how ARPA money will be spent. Our or funds has, has been spent. Or has been spent. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss. Um, what we have been up to at the MAC uh, since we were founded in 2016. Uh, but essentially, um, today I really just come to, with a message of gratitude. So much support has been demonstrated by the community uh, in support of the first responder community. And this latest project is an example of it. This $3.5 million project was made possible because of the contribution of so many individual donors that supported it, but also each and every one of you that supported us with the ARPA nonprofit process that was established last year. Um, next slide. This is a rendering of what the village looks like. The MAC was founded in 2016. Our nonprofit started with a very small budget of $300,000. We have invested over $20 million in the first responder community here in Porter County. We're located in the Mondale Industrial Park. Uh, so we're tucked away outside of site, and that's also been very intentional on our part. Um, this, the, the activities that take place there and the trainings that happen um, are sometimes Times uh, need you know require privacy and security, and therefore um, we we have uh, been very deliberate about uh, when we invite the community in, so that we don't interfere with the training taking place there. We've also done a really decent job at uh, preparing first responders once they get inside a structure, so either a home or a building. But what we did not do a good job at when designing the campus was the approach in particular the law enforcement approach. The village addresses that. We have designed it in such a way that the streets um, are wide enough, typical streets in a neighborhood that you would find, or any one of our downtown areas. Um, next slide, Kurt. And the overall layout is, is pictured here. Next slide. But here it gives you a picture of what, um, in more detail, what this project entails. Uh, we have a single story, one story house with a backyard, fence backyard, and crawl space. Next slide. The one story home, as you can see, is set up as you'd expect when walking into a residential home. Next slide. The crawl space has uh, two access points, so a lot of uh, times our canine units will uh, send their dogs through here to either identify or, or uh, locate the bad guy. Next point. We also have uh, built a two-story, uh, four-bedroom home with a full basement on premise. Next slide. And here's a, a rendering of what the inside looks like there. 
an additional picture of what the second story looks like. And this is the full basement. When we started uh, designing this uh, project, we had quite a bit of input from the law enforcement community. Uh, we had made significant investment on the fire department uh, at the fire department requests uh, throughout the campus, uh, but our law enforcement community uh, had um, had really indicated that they needed space like this, and so we developed and designed it in such a way that they had direct input in everything that happened in this space. And so at one point, we were even teased um, for it being a cop village, a cop training village. But it turns out that firefighters are using it equally as much as our law enforcement community. Next slide. Um, here it gives you an indication of what, how the firefighters would use it when they uh, come out and train and there is an incident or an, um, a fire that, that requires them to reach the attic space. This is the space that they would uh, navigate through. We also took the detached garage of the one-story home and converted it into a classroom so that they can also use it to bring in vehicles if they need to or indeed just use it as we have it set up right now with tables and chairs. And as you may recall, as part of this opera process, um, other nonprofits that were involved included the Boys and Girls Clubs, and those tables and chairs came from the old Boys and Girls Club. So um, a lot of collaboration took place amongst the other entities that were involved throughout that entire process. Student canopy that's often used right now, especially in the nice, nicer days, so they can do their briefing and their, and their debriefings outside before heading into any one of those structures. Here we have just a little bit more indication of the different features, including the breach doors. Um, and, the, and all the buildings are capable to take SIM munitions as well as smoke capabilities. And we have plans for developing a mobile home. Um, when we started the project, we, we included this as part of the process. Um, but as you may recall, during COVID, the containers uh, not only increased in price, but they also, um, they, their ability to, to find them was, was challenging as well. So um, that is something that we do plan on, on doing. As you've probably noticed, we use containers all across the campus, and that's also deliberate on our part because our first responders um, need to be very comfortable in how they train there. Um, we're not too concerned about the wear and tear of the facilities, and the containers are very durable and uh, sustainable for us during these trainings. Here's my contact information um, for anyone that has any questions or would like to tour the campus. I know that you all have been there, so thank you for that. Uh, but I really just wanna say thank you for your support. This three and a half million dollar project was matched um, not only through the support of the ARPA fund process, but also through a number of different community foundations and many, many generous donors. And so you made that all happen, and as a result, we have now offered over 400 hours, 400,000 hours of direct trainings to our first responders. We offer our facility at no cost to them or to any agents, any first responder agency throughout our county and beyond. And as a result, our campus is being utilized at minimum 15 hours per day for some sort of training. And um, again, back to our humble beginnings, never did we imagine this thing could happen and take off the way it has. But clearly the demand for such facility is, is driving that. So thank you. Yeah, and it, you know, the public, public you know, should, should understand is that before you all existed, you know, local agencies would have to, um, you know, very often have to send their personnel out of area to get that training which is expensive right. and uh, to be able to do it in our own backyard for nothing uh, or virtually nothing um, you know it's just a huge benefit to our county as a whole so I, I thank you for for that thank you. thank you and we're a 24 hour operation seven days a week so we notice a lot of uh, the weekends 
Uh, the facility is being booked by our volunteer firefighters, um, nights and weekends for that matter. And during the day, we are heavily being utilized by law enforcement in our career fire departments. So it's a win-win. Uh, we have a high school program going for training high school students to become firefighters. And so we are just at the beginning. The next phase of the MAC includes a large, large expansion in um, an additional $12 million investment that we anticipate happening within the next three years. So in terms of economic development and the draw that we are having uh, for not only the first responder community, but overall um, is really significant. And um, I encourage you to continue to stay with us and, and see where this momentum grows. Have, have you noticed or have you heard, I mean, um, and maybe one of the chiefs back here could, uh, before you all existed, I mean, since you, since you're, you had, you're up and uh, uh, been operating, uh, Selena, has, has your departments been able to train more often? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're probably out there more than we're at our station anymore. Uh, we utilize facilities for a lot of various operations and that. Some of our guys actually do construction out there with the MAC. Um, without this, we, won't, we wouldn't be able to train people to the level that needs to be. And so we had new, when we had new hires, we would have to send them to a career academy in our nights for 11 weeks. And now it's right in our backyard. And actually, one of our firefighters is the academy commander. So. Fantastic. Well, we have say-so in it, so it's worked out excellent. Yeah. What a huge advantage for us. Huge. Huge. So, and it just seems like it's getting getting better. So, again, thank you, and thank you for for applying for that <coughs> money and putting it to such a, a productive use, um, you know, for all of our residents. So, because that's touching every single one of our residents. Very much so, in a in a direct and indirect way. Yep. Thank you, Selena. Thank you, Selena. Debbie Gunn, E911. Good morning. Good morning. We have a RAVE 911 alert for public safety service, a renewal quote. What can you tell us about? Yes. Um, you may remember last year I came before you and we had a contract renewal at that time as well. We've been um, customers of RAVE Mobile Safety now for, I'd say, 12 to 13 years. We were, I think we were one of the original customers. We were, Flagship County, um, which we're also, and I'll get into it, again, we've been um, chosen as a Flagship County in another aspect of RAVE Mobile Safety Alerting. But last year, I was kind of on the verge of looking into alternatives. I felt as though the scope of our notification was limited through Smart 911 being it an opt-in um, choice through RAVE. And there was a rivaling software company that had a broader notification scope. And so I was looking into that. And I, I made my intense um, known and my, my um, desires known to both the, the rival company and RAVE. And since that time, we were actually chosen as, an, as a flagship county to, um, if you'll see if on the letter that I sent out, the proposal I sent out, we're now um, an emergency use mobile da data agency, which is really more a, um, how it was described to me. It's more of an opt out uh, function through RAVE. They mine their data through hundreds of different sources a lot of the times when we have those terms and conditions that we sign up for 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 multiple use of different products and softwares and apps and things like that that's where they're, they're getting their data so I'd like to because this is very significant just let you know our safety profiles has grown that's the smart 911 aspect which I am still advocating we just had an event in Couts over this past weekend in which we were able to really share smart 911 with the community there so I think that that's very beneficial and I want people to continue signing up for that and creating profiles. But what's very significant here is the emergency use mobile data option that we've now been given as a flagship county with RAVE. Um, you'll see that the number there, we have 47 
over 47,000 users now that are part of our platform and that we can notify in an emergency situation. Um, that's over a 550% increase in our scope of notification. Since when? Since last year. So this happened. Thank you. This happened because of you know I was I was digging in there for for alternatives that I thought would be more beneficial. They were we were we were basically they didn't want to lose our business, so we were given this opportunity. Which I'd like to publicly just tell a quick story. Uh, the end of April, there was a a female who went missing, an elderly female who went missing in the um, Valparaiso University from the Valparaiso University campus, and. There was um, search and rescue was called out, and they requested an alert. The alert was sent for the um, the radius was a five mile radius of Valparaiso University, and within eight minutes of that alert being sent, we received a call from someone who is a user, who said, "I think I've have seen that female. I think I saw her north Calumet up by Family Express at Five Points, which is a significant distance from Valparaiso University." Um, the first responders searching that area, search and rescue, Valparaiso Police was involved at this time, VUPD was involved. They were searching for in, in the area of Valparaiso University. So when, we, when they got this alert, they obviously sent units up north and they found the woman at Family Express that far north. And had it not been for the alert, who knows what the outcome would have been. So that's remarkable, a remarkable testimony for the product itself. Um, also, what leads me to stick with Rave is Rave was purchased by Motorola, and I'm seeing that Motorola is really expanding that platform. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend the Motorola conference this past spring and learned about so many different possibilities that I would like to ultimately have conversations with you in the future regarding the benefits it could provide our community. But I am, I am definitely an advocate of this. Um, I'm sold on rave, and that's why my presentation, or, or my request rather, would be for a three-year renewal of the contract as opposed to a single year. It will be cost savings, and we'll also get to familiarize ourselves with where Motorola plans on taking this product. Okay. Well, I will. Uh, I'll entertain a motion if. I move that we approve the three-year renewal for the rave. Uh, Public Safety Services Alert. Is that the one you're recommending? Yes, three years, yep. Uh, second. We have a motion and a second to um, renew the three-year contract of $59,351.61 and an annual cost total of $178,054.83. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank you. Thank you. And good job with uh, increasing the par participation. That's been a struggle for years, you know, a, a concern with the commissioners, you know, because we people just weren't jumping on us. Thank you. Thank you. Auditor's office. Uh, yes, the first ordinance is establishing one of two non-reverting funds. Um, we've been working with the Sheriff's Department, both Gary Gear and Eric Wiseman, to secure these grants. Uh, this first one is for about $400,000. Uh, the second one we should hear back on soon. That should be on your agenda next month. Um, but this is going to be the first reading uh, creating that non-reverting fund for us to receive those monies into. Do we have anybody here from the Sheriff's Department? No? Okay. So we have a requ re request uh, to create an ordinance establishing a non-reverting fund for the COPS uh, Community Oriented Policing Services Technology and Equipment Program Invitational solic Solicitation Grant. Well, that's a mouthful. First, <laughs> first reading. And have, I mean, and, and how is this money exactly, how is this money going to be? Uh, this is federal funding. Federal funding, mm -hmm. okay. So we have a, a, the first rating. I will close the public, uh, or the uh, commissioner's meeting and open it up, our public meeting, uh, to hear, to accommodate the first reading. Um, 
I'll ask, I'll, we'll start out by asking those in favor of the ordinance to come up and you can speak. Um, you don't have to. Just like you don't have to if you, you oppose it, but it's just, uh, uh, just letting you all know. Um, anyone in favor of speaking in favor of this ordinance? Second call, anyone in favor of speaking in favor of this ordinance? Third and final call, anyone in favor of speaking in favor of this ordinance? My name is Robert Cotton. I'd just like for you to explain a little bit more about the terms and circumstances with regard to what that uh, ordinance entails, meaning <coughs> what would be the... This, uh, uh, this ordinance simply creates the fund in which the money from the community-oriented police services uh, solicitation grant would be placed assuming we uh, were <coughs> awarded that grant and I'm assuming we were that's why we're doing the fund so this ordinance is just creating the actual fund in which this grant would then be placed and then that would be subject to county council appropriation um, I'm assuming at the request of the sheriff's department I apologize uh, what I meant was actually uh, to speak more about the terms and circumstances associated with the underlying grant funding. As it is federal, there will be certain constraints and or uh, expectations, I suppose, as to how that is used. And I would appreciate some greater understanding of what this all, you know, the, you know, the act of appropriation, I, I get that, creating a fund. It's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in understanding the nature and circumstances associated with getting the money at all. Well, as the, as the ordinance uh, states, uh, Robert, is, it is to purchase technology and equipment associated to doing police work. Now, we could, no doubt there's probably more details than that uh, that uh, that need to be talked about. That's honestly, that's why I asked if anybody from the Sheriff's Department was here today. Um, but um, and we can we can get into that. We can, uh, for the second reading, ask ask them to, to be here and and to um, uh, provide more information to, to those who need it okay thank you uh, uh, what are they doing first okay anybody opposed to okay anybody opposed to this ordinance come forward Second call, anybody opposed to the ordinance? Third and final call, anybody opposed to this ordinance? All right, thank you. We'll close the public session back to the commissioners. I'll entertain a, uh, a motion. Move that we approve the ordinance establishing a non reverting fund for the COPS Technology and Equipment Program Invitational Solicitation Grant on first reading. Second. A motion to approve and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. A motion approved. <clears throat> and number two, we have an ordinance establishing a non reverting fund for the uh, reimbursement of COVID related expenses from FEMA grants. First reading. Thank you. Anybody from EMA here? David, what do, what do you know about this? Uh, my understanding is that this was secured by the health department and that a vast majority of this funding is going to be reimbursed to the Expo Center um, for services rendered during COVID. Um, it sounds like we spoke with uh, John Piskowitz and he said Nearly all of the $337,000 was approved by FEMA, so this ordinance establishes the non-reverting fund to receive those monies into. Okay, we'll close the commissioners, open it up to the public. Anybody would like to speak in favor of this ordinance? <coughs> Second call, anybody care to speak in favor of the ordinance? What was your name, ma'am? <laughs> we all know who you are. Okay, but anyway, um, this is a, a great thing that's going on, and I agree with the, uh, the previous one. I was a little bit concerned uh, hearing more about it, just like uh, Mr. 
Thank you, Sylvia. Now you messed me up. I don't know if I was on the first or the second call. Now you have one, one more. Call. All right. One more. Uh, second, uh, third, and final call. Those, in, anybody in favor of the ordinance? Thank you. Anybody not in favor of the ordinance? Second call. Anybody not in favor of the ordinance? Third and final call. Anyone not in favor of the ordinance? We'll close the public session. Open it back up to the commissioners. We'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve the ordinance establishing a non reverting fund for the reimbursement of COVID related expenses from FEMA grants on first reading. Second. We have a motion to approve and a second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. U.S. Imaging Proposal Scan Auditor Record Books. Yes, lastly in front of you for your consideration is a proposal that we're very excited to share with you. Um, the Auditor's Office has been working with U.S. Imaging to get a quote for scanning of our transfer books. Uh, we currently have transfer books that go back as far as 1859 from Porter County, and they there's about 450 of those right now in the Auditor's Office. Um, those are not only a vital piece of history from Porter County, but we also use them very, very often on a day-to-day -day basis where an individual can trace the lineage and, of a parcel and how it was created. Um, right now, what this is going to do is not only memorialize those, protects them from any sort of destruction or preserves them moving forward, but um, part of this proposal would make these um, indexable so we could be able to share these online and taxpayers would no longer have to come into the auditor, auditor's office to search through these. Um, but this is all from $400,000 in ARPA funding that we were approved for, and the total cost of the project is about $289,000. We pay after each phase is complete. The heavy lifting is going to be the scanning portion where they come in and actually scan all those in. And then phases two and three consist of cleaning of the images and putting those on hard drives and indexing them. Um, so it's going to be a several month project um, and you'll notice that there's a little bit of an increase in the cost of this based upon the fact that we were not comfortable offering 24 hour access to the, those individuals scanning in there. So that did bump the price up a bit, but it, do, it does still come under budget. Okay. So we'll need a, a motion to to approve the proposal itself. Correct. I'll make a motion to approve. I second. We have a motion to approve a proposal from U.S. Imaging to scan um, county auditor's record books. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Now we're we're about halfway through this I'm going to ask the audience to raise their hands real quick who would like a five minute break and when I say five I don't mean ten five I can't I can't upset the, the host writer so okay we're gonna we're gonna break for five minutes and please be back here especially the, the department heads who are on the on the agenda please be back here in five minutes thank you what? Thank you, buddy. Yeah, really appreciate your time, man. Good luck. Thanks for all your hard work. Absolutely, Dick. I'm so excited for you. Really appreciate Thanks it. for what you do. Yeah. And a, please a, come a next year and ask for money again, okay? Sure. We're going to have a grant process gonna, next year. So when we do this grand opening, you're going to come hang out? Sure, let you know when Absolutely. It, yeah. So the yeah. idea is, like, I think, uh, like, Fridays and Saturdays. <laughs> We want to open up like on weekends when yeah. football starts. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. That's when we think we're going to have a lot yeah. of people yeah. watching the game on yeah. Sundays. Yeah. And get a lot of us can go to a bar or yeah. certain places. Right. So let's just right. go here and do the same thing. I love it. I love it.
No, it's a great idea. What would be the next start? What would you suggest we do uh, no, it'll just be the council. Uh, we're going to pass a resolution at our next meeting. The council then has to appropriate the funds, and you'll be able to, you know, go to the auditors and. What should I tell the landlord? Because like I was saying before, he has, he is holding. Let him board. know that uh, it's been approved at the commissioner level, and then it's just a matter of the council appropriating the funds. And is that the same thing? Is that what I mean? No, that won't be until the twenty seventh. So we'd be at that. You don't need to be at that meeting. Um, the council, Greg Sims has asked the council, will ask the council to watch this portion of the meeting for your presentation. So you don't have to show up again. Yeah. Well, you could tell him that the commissioners voted for it and you've got an advocate on the council. So hopefully we'll get the blessing. I don't see why you won't, but I can't speak for the council. So. Greg had told me it's all good news too. I was like, oh, we're fine. Yeah. My, my thing is, I just want to make sure with the landlord, because like I said, it is a yeah. deputy, so it's right. Yeah. So there's yeah. no money exchange. Yeah. But, if I give them but you're also going to want to talk to Dave and ask him what the process is going to be in terms of getting the actual money once it's been approved. So, Wishlinski with the auditor's office. Yeah. He'll be back. Okay. He'll be back. Thank you. Yeah, he called me Thursday or Friday last week. I mean, we don't week. have a problem doing this. Yeah. You can tell him that. Okay. We just got to figure out the options. Okay. Very right. good. Thanks. I might need to get with you. Uh, they have the, those three, four organizations that got approved for the opioid funding. Well, they're, 
tentatively approved. Yes, right? yes, tentatively approved. Um, some the council sort of, doesn't. Some sort of documentation for them to show mm -hmm. whoever. So would that, how would that be? Form of a probably needs to be an agreement that I probably put together for them all to sign. Okay, yeah, yeah. To dot the I's and cross the T's. Because I know they, the one guy has at least that least thing. Yeah. Them, so yeah. Um, I might need your hand. Yeah, he yeah. I might need your hand with that. You, you have my email. Um, it's on the presentation. Correct? Okay, cool. Yeah, I think, is it on the present? I'll just get it anyway. PRA board president. I'll tell you what, it rains and pours. I don't know how my dad's going to make it today. I got you. It's been a terrible day. And his fucking sister is still up in the emergency room, up in the ICU. Alrighty, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. Congrats on your hard work. Yeah. I want to say, if I can talk to you, tell me. Not an emergency. So then I called him on break. He's up there. And they're talking to him. 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 So that was a long and short of it. Add those cars. Yeah. She goes to a nursing home. See, I don't like all that meat. I can have two. That's it. Better. Sausage and pepper. Yeah, I've got an employee like that. Or two before we got my mouth. That's all he wants. She's not one of the people. Look, it's her problem. She's 80 and small. I see what you mean. Can't worry. I've got a sister with different hands. I picture him today. I like him. Almost all of his sisters. I love everything on him. He's got two that are like little beggars pizza. Really? He's got one a year older, one a year younger, but then the rest of them, the five, are there's a bigger group up here. You know what I mean? So my dad's 69, the oldest one's like 81. You're joking or something? You're joking. 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 You're Seventy, he was a six or seven years. Yeah. So he's up there with them, and, and of course his family drives me crazy. They fucking killing me right now. Five minutes, no more. Not ten minutes, five minutes. I can see it being. I can see it being all. Not ten minutes, five minutes. An ARPA agreement. They only smoked half a cigarette. What's going on at your He broke it. <laughs> Take that. Sometimes it gets lost if there's actual requirements. You know, How about that? Imagine that. This is not Yosemite Sam time, you know what I mean? This is the longest five minute break in the history of five minute breaks. I just, I have this many on that. You can get, probably get it delivered. I just said, I said, this is not going to get over. No idea. Mr. Hay, did you bring enough to share with everyone, Mr. Spitzer? I did ask if it was the first time. They had a lot of nerve <laughs> just rolled right right the right way to run them all the time. It's me. Or try to contact me. You guys are worthless. She told me five minutes had gone by. Yeah, I'm sure. I know it. <laughs> I figured you'd catch on after 15 minutes. Oh shit, well this thing went dead on me. It's Scott's fault. <laughs> IT Department Lee, what do you have for us? Um, 
when I did budgets this last year, I, I planned for a years of training for my employees, and then we have the no before, which is the phishing attacks, and that which it's more training for spam mails and that to the employees. Um, when I did the employee, uh, my staff's in training program, the three-year program was a much bigger savings. So I opted to go with the three-year, and it left me a shortfall in my budget of $1,790, which I had in another account, so I'm just asking to transfer that to pay the bill. Motion to approve. And a second. A motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Then before you, you have a contract from NITCO. Right now, E91 receives its internet and telephone service through a line connected to the Sheriff's Department. Should that line go down, all of their services go down. So this will be another redundant line coming from our building. So if one goes down, they still have internet and telephones. I move that we approve the NITCO quote to provide redundant internet to the, uh, to the E911 department for a 36 month term. We have a second? Second. We have a motion uh, to approve with a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank you. Highway much. Department, Jim Polaric. We, we have a request for an additional appropriation fund 1176 from account 2362 by Tuminous in the amount of $500,000, 50% of matching funds for 2023 uh, CCMG grant. Correct. Uh, yeah, the 50, 500000 which would be half of the matching funds for the CCMG, will come out of, of state or uh, M motor vehicle highway fund. Okay. And then uh, next we'll be having to transfer that into the CCMG fund. Okay. We'll entertain a motion. Commissioner Biggs, you can do one, two, and three together. Okay. We'll do that. Uh, then we have a request for an additional appropriation for... Fund 9400, account 2362, by Tuminous in the amount of $2 million. Uh, 2023 CCMG grant state and local match funds coming. Correct. Uh, we'll be getting a check from the state for $1 million, and then uh, the previous half million will go into that fund to be allocated out of there, along with an additional uh, half a million from where the commissioners and council end up coming up okay. with. Okay. Then we have a request for an ad uh, additional appropriation. Fund 1169, account 3650, vehicle repair in the amount of $150,000 additional needed to increase parts cost. Yeah, um, we had to do this last year and again this year, so we're going to, when we do budgets here in a few weeks, we'll be increasing that for next year so we don't have to do this again, but just parts cost have gone through the roof. We'll enter, entertain a motion for items one, two, and three. I move to approve the additional appropriation of five hundred thousand dollars for fund eleven seventy six account twenty three sixty two bituminous, as well as the additional appropriation of two million dollars for fund uh, number ninety four hundred account number twenty three sixty two bituminous, as well as the additional appropriation of one hundred fifty thousand for fund 1169 account 3650 vehicle repair. We have a se second. second. We have a motion uh, to approve with a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. We have a request for pay increases for the following positions. Could you go ahead quickly? Okay. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, Mr. Rivas from the council and then uh, Mr. Biggs asked me to look into what we need to compensate our mechanics at in order to keep them and attract new mechanics since we've been short for several years. Uh, after doing some research, you know, uh, these mechanics aren't just regular mechanics, they're also heavy equipment mechanics. And scale for a heavy equipment mechanic in this area is $46 an hour to $56 an hour. Um, obviously, I don't think we're in a position right now to ask the council to approve $46 an hour salaries, but then when I go online to like the Indeed website, there's all kinds of pages of mechanics up to $35 an hour. And they've been open on that site for a while. So I think in order to even 
have people look at it and qualify people to apply. I believe we need these are the salaries we need to uh, increase those positions to at 37 for the mechanics foreman, 35 an hour for the mechanics, and uh, mechanics assistant to 28. Okay. Well, it's just you know it's honestly it's a long time in coming. I mean, as you know, we've we've had a mechanics or mechanics positions open for the better part of two years because we can't fill them because of, of we're not paying them of what uh, the um, you know what we're our competition is paying so uh, we have a mechanics foreman at 26.91 per hour and do a, a requested pay increase to 37 per hour mechanics position um, at 25.74 per hour and to be increased, request to, in, to be increased to $35 per hour. And then assistant mechanics position currently being paid $20 per hour to be increased to $28 per hour. I'll entertain a motion or discussion. I have a motion to approve. I second. I have a motion to approve with a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Okay, uh, the next item is just some housekeeping. Um, there's three uh, or two memos and then a SOP I uh, presented to you. Um, just and I also did put together a, a resolution. Uh, so pursuant to Indiana Code 522-228, property deemed worthless or, or the cost or market value of the property uh, is less than the uh, sale or the cost of the sale or transportation is worth more than the property then the commissioners can deem that property to be worthless that would include uh, byproducts from the normal operations of the highway department such as logs wood chips tree trimming remove uh, tree trimming slash removal soil from ditch cleaning contaminated stone and slag and asphalt millings the above listed byproducts shall be considered worthless as they are no market value or if market value, the market value is less than the estimated cost of the sale or disposal and transportation um, uh, of, of the property. So the undersigned, the highway superintendent may dispose slash donate the above listed byproducts at his uh, discretion. And Jim also prepared the form for people to complete if they are requesting those materials. Did you have a chance to look at that, Scott? Yes, that's fine. Okay. okay. This, this is what the commissioners need to do, and then his SOPs are okay. part of his department okay. on how to deal with it. Okay. okay. I move that we approve the resolution for the disposition of property within the highway department. Second. We have a motion to approve with a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. De Development and Stormwater Management, Mike Novotny. Good morning. Hi. Just go ahead and start when you. Uh, agenda item number one is a cooperative uh, agreement between the National Park Service and Porter County. This formalizes the working agreement and arrangement uh, that the county has had with the Park Service over the last several years regarding the planning and design of the Marquette Greenway, uh, as well as construction and maintenance of the trail. So the department is requesting the board's approval of this agreement this morning. Scott, have you had an opportunity to? Yes, I have. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve a cooperative management agreement between the National Park Services, Indiana Dunes National Park, and Porter County. But we have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Uh, sec second agenda item I have for you is a an LPA consulting agreement between uh, the Board of Commissioners and Lockmuller Group. Incorporated our design and engineering consultant for the replacement of Bridge 66, which carries County Road 250 West over Phillips Ditch. Uh, the value of this agreement is not to exceed $29,255.00, and this is for right of way acquisition services associated with that bridge replacement project. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. 
We have a motion to approve an LAP, a consulting agreement between the Porter County Board of Commissioners and Lock Miller Group um, for the replacement of Bridge 66 over County Road 250 West over Phillips Ditch, not to exceed $29,255. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Number three. The department is also requesting the board's approval of uh, an LPA consulting agreement between uh, the board and Lockmiller Group, who is our, so also our design and engineering consultant for the replacement of Bridge One, which carries Division Road over Hutton Ditch, aka Cricket Creek. Uh, this is for right-of-way acquisition services once again, and the value of the agreement is not to exceed $25,250.00. Okay. We'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve the LPA consulting agreement uh, for the replacement of Bridge 1 Structure 164-0001 Division Road over Hutton Ditch, not to exceed 25250 Second. We have a motion to approve with a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Number four. Uh, this is a uh, an amendment to the Porter County Unified Development Ordinance uh, addressing telecom uh, telecommunication <coughs> facilities, particularly the towers. Um, and this would address section. This would. Uh, equate with in, in changes equate to changes in section 5.69 uh, of the UDO which addresses telecommunication facility standards and sections 5.70 uh, which addresses uh, height limits uh, associated with telecommunication facilities okay. motion to approve. we have a motion to approve a unified development ordinance pertaining to section it's five first it's a first read. Oh, sorry it's, first a, it's read. an ordinance so this is I'm your sorry. first sorry. reading sorry. of this <laughs> ordinance <laughs> that would allow denied. these changes to occur okay we're going to close the commission's <laughs> meeting open up to the pub the public uh, portion um ask uh, anybody in favor of this ordinance please step forward anybody in favor of this ordinance please step forward third and final request Anybody in favor of this ordinance, please step forward. Anybody opposing this ordinance, please step forward. Second call, anybody opposing this ordinance, please step forward. Third and final call, anybody opposed to this ordinance, please step forward. Thank you. Close the public session, back to the commissioners. Entertain a motion. Motion to approve. And first reading. And on second. second. We have a motion to approve on first reading a unified development ordinance pertaining to section 5.69 telecommunication, telecommunication facility standards and 5.70 tele, telecommunication facilities height limit. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Number five. Uh, it, the department is requesting the board's approval of uh, a supplemental agreement, uh, number one, with USI consultants, uh, who are our design and engineering consultants on our bridge 168 replacement project. This is the bridge carrying uh, 250 East Brummett Road over the east arm of the Little Calumet River. Um, this would increase the value of the agreement by an additional $39,500. The agenda reads to, to, an, to a value not to exceed $275,000. It's actually $257,500.00 would be the not to exceed, uh, new not to exceed fee. This is for additional construction observation uh, resident project representative services provided by USI during construction. If you will recall, we had delays with getting utilities out of the way, uh, which meant that the bridge construction started later. That extended our construction period. So USI has spending additional time uh, on site providing these services. And this is the value or approximated value not to exceed of those additional services. This is the bridge that has caused all the. This is the bridge concern. that has caused all the rerouting of traffic and right. concern next about to access. Brummett School. And, yes, right next to Brummett Elementary School. I actually went by that the other day. It looks looks pretty. You can 
you can now see what it is going to be. It yes. It uh, looks very nice. We are probably just about a month away from uh, being able to open that uh, to traffic. We're about a month away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because when this story appears in the paper, I'm going to get the calls. How far? Did you get that? Paper? Month away. Because they'll, they'll ask. They'll ask on yep. social media. And what was the not to exceed so the amount. new the new the the value of the supplement is thirty nine thousand five hundred dollars and zero cents, which brings the new overall not to exceed amount to two hundred and fifty seven thousand five hundred dollars and zero cents. Okay. Motion to approve the supplemental agreement for USI consultants for bridge one sixty eight replacement, County Road two fifty East over East Arm Little Calumet River, not to exceed two hundred and fifty seven thousand five hundred dollars. Do I have a second? That's not what our. How much is it? It's, it's two fifty-seven okay. five hundred. Okay. The Thank agenda you. is is wrong. Yeah. yeah. Second. We have a motion to approve with a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Uh, the next uh, item I have for you, the, the department's uh, requesting the board's approval of a, another LPA consulting contract with United Consulting, who is our design and engineering consultant on our bridge 131 uh, replacement project. That bridge carries 200 west over Damon Run. Uh, this is for construction observation resident project representative services. Um, this is a, a contract in the value in, a, in the value of not to exceed one hundred and seventy five thousand uh, two hundred dollars and zero cents. Entertain a motion. I move that we accept the um, is that LPA is that cost? LPA yeah, consulting the LPA agreement. consulting contract with United Consulting <coughs> for Bridge One Thirty One. County Road 200 West over Damon Run, not to exceed $175,200. Second. We have a motion to approve with a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Item 7. This is an, L an LPA consulting contract uh, with United Consulting for our Porter County uh, Bridge Inspection Program. Uh, for the years 2024 through 2027, so a four-year agreement. Um, this this is the result of uh, a consultant selection process that was started late last year. Three consultants responded to our uh, RFQ uh, request for qualifications that was issued uh, to start that uh, selection process. United was recommended to the board at their March at your March 14th meeting. Uh, based on the scoring and evaluation of those submitted letters of interest, the commissioners accepted our recommendation, authorized the department to negotiate this contract. This contract that's in front of you is the result of that. Uh, the value of the contract is not to exceed $478,457.19. And this is for the four-year uh, inspection and assessment cycle for the years 2024 to 2027. Now, it's not that all of our bridges are ex inspected every year. It just takes four years to inspect them all. Uh, it, by Per the federal highway requirements, mm -hmm. we've got to respect, uh, inspect all of our bridges every two years. Um, those that are in poor condition or fracture critical have to be uh, inspected every year. Okay. Um, so this will carry through of two of those cycles. Okay. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the LPA consulting contract for 2024 20, to 2027. Second. For United Consulting, we have a motion to approve not to exceed $478,457.19. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Item 8. And this is just an announcement uh, that we are now seeking sealed bids for uh, our 2023 CCMG paving projects. You guys just had the highway department up here uh, moving money around to be able to pay for the paving. So uh, we expect to open uh, sealed bids at the next meeting, um, your July meeting, and award the contracts 
uh, the contract for that paving at that time. Okay. Good morning meeting. Thank Good you. morning meeting. Yep. Thank you, Michael. Anything else you'd like to share with us? That's all I've got. Good. Board? Nothing? Thank you very much. Um, next item on our list is Valpo Events. Uh, Katie? She's going to be Okay. Uh, there's a request to use the courthouse grounds on Saturday, October 7th uh, of this year from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. for the 2023 autumn uh, prom promenade. Uh, various downtown realtors will distribute fall and holiday themed treats. There will be a small frame sign and a 10 by 10 tent canopy. Entertain a motion. I move to approve the request for Valpo events to use the courthouse grounds on Saturday, October 7th from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. for the 2023 autumn. Second. We have a motion to approve with a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. And um, Harmony Handbills. Linda Haddock. She also was not in the same time. Okay, we have a request for the courthouse grounds on Sunday, July 9th from 1.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. for Ringing in the Breeze to make handbill music. Ringers from uh, the Valpo area are invited to play along. Uh, they will set up four six-foot tables and two 10, 10 by 10 uh, canopies. I'll uh, entertain a motion. Motion to approve. And second. So we have a motion to approve with a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. ABM, Eric Dunstan. I guess I'm alone. Thank you, everyone. I uh, really appreciate the time over the past uh, few months that we've been working with the county to do a um, what we call a preliminary assessment of the facilities um, throughout the county. And also, I do have with me here um, Dan Roth. I want to introduce him. He was our developer on the project, so he's walked all of the um, facilities with Daniel here and his team as well. So really appreciate the support. Um, and of course of the Commission allowing us and, and again for the time today to present. So with that, I'd, I'd like to kind of dive in and we'll look at, um, we looked at seven buildings over the course of again the past few months and what the facilities and things we could do. So some of the key takeaways is, um, you know, using the, 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 the current buildings as a means of revenue to fund the changes from an energy perspective, maintenance and operational savings and things of that nature. And uh, also a big takeaway is going to be to reduce the risk to the county. Um, so capital volatility over the years and whether equipment fails, um, windows leaking, things of that nature, really everything that we looked at throughout our scope. Um, and also just improving the facilities, not only from of course the efficiency perspective of it, but as well as the, the people in the, that are using those facilities. Um, and, and so one big thing too, when we do talk about this and when um, you know, we move towards a, a proposal throughout full development, is the results are guaranteed from the energy savings. Um, and as well, the project scope when we come in and the price, I know earlier it was mentioned, um, change orders. We, we guarantee there are no change orders. Um, when we deliver a proposal to the county, and unless they're county initiated change orders or very specific requests, uh, we do not do that. Once we give a price, it is guaranteed. So with that, we'll um, I think we'll we'll dive in, and again, just to reiterate the funding, um, there's going to be a pretty significant pie that's energy savings, as you'll see when we look at all the buildings, and again, that uh, capital avoidance and uh, major repairs as well are just a few that we'll highlight, and you'll see some reoccurring themes as we jump into the buildings that we're going to look at. Um, next slide, please. So the first one I, I really wanted to highlight was the Juvenile Detention Center. I know we've already talked about that a little bit today. Uh, I've got to tell a little bit of a story. As I um, pulled up there into the back of the JDC and we saw the cooling tower, um, it, was, it, it looked like a waterfall. So it, it was one of the first warm days when we were doing our site walk. And um, I think it had recently been turned on and it was leaking significant. 
now um, I would say almost approaching the, the point of catastrophic failure where there would not be cooling for the JDC. Um, now I do have to give Daniel and his team uh, in incredible props there. They did a, a fantastic job in making sure that they have repaired it for the time being. It is temporary repairs, but it is working and they've uh, made sure that they still do have cooling. Um, but those are some of the things we saw. So when we, we went through JDC, both the inside and the outside of the building, um, a few things, the, the boiler plant um, is, in, is old. I believe it is original, well over 20 years old. Um, and the controls are outdated as well. Uh, so it's, um, we would recommend the redoing the controls, recommissioning along with the entire building automation system. There's also some room for indoor air quality improvements which would be, there, there's a potential to look at what we, uh, bipolar ionization is the technology that ultimately cleans the air in the environment. Um, and another aspect would be reducing that outside air. So that's while providing clean air, you can again reduce the cost and just operate the equipment much more efficiently. Um, repair, replace, heat pumps, makeup air, um, again, very old original equipment um, through all of the mechanical, I would say. Another key scope item that you'll see is kind of recurring through theme throughout all the buildings is the building envelope. So what that is is going to be your, your windows, your doors, any place where there's um, air and water infiltration. So now we've conditioned the spare air. It can come in and out. Um, and we've got some pictures that do a great job of showing exactly what we're talking about with that. Um, so perfect. I, I think really here you'll see another thing is lighting. Uh, that top left, we've got some aged lighting where we have some opportunity to really convert that over to LED. On the lower left, just so I won't go through every one, you'll see the cracks at the doors. A lot of the doors are like that where their seams are just not sealed, um, sealed very well or they're off center. So there's some room for replacements there or some work. Um, and again, just to highlight way over on the right, that is that cooling tower. And you can kind of see all the water pouring down those pillars. It really was um, all around the, that cooling tower, too. I mean, it was um, a substantial amount of, of water. And that's energy, that's waste, that's the conditioned water, et cetera. And then again, if it has catastrophic failure, there is no cooling to that JDC. Um, so that unit is, is quite old and needs to be replaced. Yes, because the, the building itself is not 20, it's 30 years old. Yeah, and a lot of the equipment is original, uh, and the controls especially are original. So that's one of the key things by optimizing, um, you know, demand-based ventilation. So we, we deliver cool there, for example, as needed as opposed to, you know, schedule-based. Let's go to the uh, next. I think so, so this building was a, another one. Um, and actually, I forgot to highlight, I guess, on the JDC, but it was right around the same. We are over $3 a square foot. So I do want to point that out in the orange right there. So the admin building where we are right now, uh, you'll see the annual utility is, is just shy of $250,000 and uh, $3.21 per square foot. And the JDC uh, was right around there as well. So again, from the admin building, uh, we have boiler. Uh, again, aged HVAC equipment. So the boiler is very old. The boiler system is very old. The controls are incredibly old. Uh, this building specifically, we're actually still using pneumatic controls, uh, which is a very old and, and inefficient technology. So we would recommend um, completely upgrading that building automation system to uh, direct digital control and, and getting rid of the pneumatics. And that's going to provide us, again, a lot of efficiencies, a lot of flexibility in how we operate the building. Um, there's some opportunity for what we call coil coating on the HVAC, and that's just going to extend that life uh, expectancy of the equipment, reduce some of that maintenance and that operational drain on it. Um, again, indoor air quality, lighting upgrades throughout this building, uh, probably 50% of them seem to be upgraded. Um, Whereas that other 50% is that there's some significant um, potential for savings, really getting to that LED technology. Uh, again, building envelope, and you'll, you'll see some on the next slide. Um, and again, HVAC VFDs. So those are variable frequency drives. Right now, the system is either on, kind of full blast, or it's off uh, for the pumps and the, the chilled water. 
Uh, we would recommend going to variable frequency drives and you can, again, save a significant amount of energy when you use that type of technology. Um, so we would install uh, things of that nature for the pumping and also water conservation. A lot of the fixtures are not low flow fixtures, um, efficient valves, things of that nature. So there's, again, room for not only the electricity but water conservation as well. Um, and you'll see one picture on the, the printer room, uh, perfect transition. You see the red arrow in the kind of the third on the top. Um, that is on a cooling unit for the printer room that is running independently, but what we're really drawing the, the line to is that water is going right to the drain rather than recycling it. So that is, I would say, a gallon a minute, and I don't know the exact measurement, but it's pretty significant where it is just consistently, when it is cooling, it is dumping the, the conditioned water into the drain. Um, and, and again, so you'll see on the door uh, some pretty significant gaps uh, for that air uh, infiltration. See some of the lighting, old lighting versus the LED lighting. There's a picture of that pump right there where we could show the, um, do the VFDs for that uh, variable frequency drives. And, and again, some of those very old, outdated, or in some, some instances, the controls that simply aren't working. So go to the uh, next one. Um, MOH, the Memorial Opera House. I know we've talked quite a bit uh, about this today. We did look at the Memorial Opera House as well, um, not from the exterior perspective necessarily or the bricks, uh, as I know were mentioned, but really we focus on the building envelope and the HVAC um, on this building. So in, this was an interesting one. When we got there, um, the condensing unit outside was actually completely inoperable. So there's a, it's a four compressor condenser. And again, I, I, Daniel and his crew, I, I understand. So there was no cooling at all uh, when we first arrived and did that site walk. And his team, again, has done a, a great job of getting it up and running for the time being. I, I know they were able to get some used equipment um, and kind of patch that and, and get some of the cooling. So again, well done there. And that's something where we would recommend replacing the boilers, the controls, the water heater, um, a lot of it is actually completely inoperable at this point, or, or some of the controls on the, the boiler system were even... Any idea how old those are? Oh, goodness. I'm uh, going to lean on yeah, Dan here. The boiler and the condensers. But yeah, they're, they're in the 20-year age also. Yes. 20, okay, so 20, 20 plus years on those as well. Um, and the condenser outside and the air handler in the basement, the coils, I mean, all of it. There's pinhole leaks throughout some of the piping, uh, which is where there was no cooling fluid. Uh, again, Daniel and his team had to refill that and kind of get that running so we had something for the summer. So these are all, all things we found. Again, um, indoor air quality, you'll see some of the infiltration, um, LED, the lighting, again, and controls upgrades or, or opportunities there. Um, and I've got a few pictures on the next slide as well. And, and just a note real quick, that building is actually at $6.60 a square foot last year is what it's operating at. And what, what was it? $6.60 a square foot. Um, and you'll see where we would like to go to at the end here on some of these buildings. Um, and, and again, the doors with the cracks, um, that picture in the basement is, is the air handling unit. They were working on it because it was inoperable at the time. Some of the old lighting. Uh, again, controls, doors, and, and really a full HVAC renovation. For a building of that size, that figure that you, you, you uh, tossed out, is that high? Incredibly it's high. Five or six Incredibly times high. high. Yeah, I, oh, we, really? we would shoot, I mean, if I was we taking a stab at it. new windows. And yeah. Please don't hold me to this, but I mean, we, we to Dan's point, five, six times high, you should be <coughs> low dollar, dollar fifty, I would say. If I remember right, the uh, North County building was about a dollar fifty per square. Yep, I have that on here, and, and we'll show that as well for kind of where we would hope to be uh, from our cost per square foot. Now, some of the buildings are going to be different. In this building, we're over three dollars. Like we are three and a quarter per square foot, right? Correct. So we're high relative to where you'd like to see us. Absolutely. What were we at the JV, JDC? It's right around three dollars and fifteen cents, fifty cents a square foot. So it's. It's very old equipment, and the controls have not been updated. It's it's operating very inefficiently. Type of use for the building makes a difference too, though. So you, know, you have 24-hour type of use for the building. 
you know, okay. the 24 hour facilities are going to have different than a 12 hour facility. You didn't go into jail, correct? We did. Yep. You did? We did. Okay. That's coming up. Uh, I, I think we saved the best, one of the best for last. Depends on what your definition All right, so uh, excellent. Moving on to the courthouse. And you'll see even the courthouse is at $3.07 a square foot. Um, again, same theme, right? So we, we do have a, an age boiler, boiler plant. Um, VFDs again, so that is operating as well at, at constant speed is what I would call it. Um, building automation controls, indoor air quality, um, recommissioning the HVAC system, uh, also lighting in the courthouse. Uh, again, that was probably 50% of the lighting has been done in the courthouse. Yeah. Um, so there's still some pretty significant opportunity for those energy savings. And the return on investment of, of LED lights is, is pretty good. It really has. So we want to leverage those types of technologies um, that ultimately generate that return. Uh, building envelope, again, some of the access entry points you'll see have gaps all over the place. They're just really not covered up. Um, some of the windows, uh, not specifically the courthouse, but you'll see are leaking. There's significant water damage. Um, electrical upgrades, replacing some of the transformers with high efficiency transformers. Um, and again, water conservation. He said courthouse. Huh? He said not, courthouse. not courthouse. That was the windows in the courthouse are new. Yeah, the, the windows in the courthouse are good. Panic there for a second. No, sorry. It was the. Um, They're which, all there. The annex, I believe. The annex, the yeah, the annex, annex has annex. leaking windows. Yeah. So again, some pictures of the courthouse. You'll see uh, clear. You can see daylight under the doors um, oh. right there. So that's. Uh, are you talking about just the annex? Is that 157 in Valpo, or is that the 157? Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, the, the lights. So you can see there's some pre pretty significant density of the lights in the courtrooms as well. Some of them, um, some of them are LEDs and some of them are not LEDs. So there's uh, different colors, different um, power usage. It's, it's uh, somewhat sporadic, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, and again, you can see some uh, also the old uh, pneumatic controls there in the top right. Uh, and there is a picture, again, as you said, I believe it's been repaired now, but where some of the water damage has been in the past and the pumps as well. And again, traditional faucets, so room for energy as well as, again, water conservation. Okay. There's some building envelope incursion of water outside of the windows as well, to, to the point. Yes. Yep, absolutely. What's causing all the yep. So we, do, we would we would want to find out exactly what is, is causing that and prevent it before it gets you know, beyond repair, so to speak. Uh, we, we have had some minor damage of water getting in there in, in unusual storm surges. Or, gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, yes or no? Yes, yes. Okay. So for instance, I, I know of one uh, in particular, we haven't identified the exact source yet, uh, above the main entrance from Indiana Avenue uh, does come down into there into the custodial space right there that that entrance the door is new uh, the the wind windows above are new but it's getting in probably between uh, the vertical and horizontal sections of the stone thank you Daniel so and that's something we would want to look at um, for that as well again that building envelope is critical <coughs> to, to the life of that building um, so moving to the annex building, and here's where we see um, the county has done some work on the annex building. And now what I want to point out, too, as we talk about this one, this is actually down to $1.91 per square foot. So you can see this is quite a bit better than $3.50 or the, this over $6 at the Opera House. So this is getting more in line with where we generally would shoot for a building. And so I, th I believe there's some things we could do here to further improve that even. Um, so and that's highlighted with, I'd say, the building automation system, recommission that. Um, that HVAC coil coating gets us a few um, efficiency points, so to speak. Um, reducing that outside air for that indoor air quality with the bipolar ionization. And, and then again, some of that building envelope and highlighting that um, 
the windows, there's some glazing, the sealants, uh, and repairing and replacing some of the windows where, again, they are leaking. As well as just kind of a final scope item would be so replacing some of the transformers with high efficiency transformers. Um, so here's again a few pictures of the annex building. This was in uh, some newer HVAC equipment up on the roof, and you can see the impact that has on the utility cost. Uh, I know it's hard to see, but on that lower left, that window, you can see there's been some brickwork and repair work there, but some of the other ones have not been done, and they are leaking. Um, and then again, around that door right there, you can see daylight almost around the entire thing. So that's just we're losing our air, and also there's the risk of water. So we're still at, okay. We're that previous uh, screen there. We're we were still at 57, frankly. 157. Yep. Yes, correct. Yep. All right, so and this is, I, I mean, North Porter County, we went there, you know, this is, um, this is a great example of where we should be, right? This has been recently redone, and again, that shows in your annual utility spend, we're down to $1.14 per square foot. So that just kind of sets the stage of what we can do and what we would hope to do, kind of the goal. Um, very minor things there. Uh, can you go back one? Can you go back one? Sorry. Um, I really want to highlight some of the pictures here. So again, you can see all of the HVAC. There's VFDs, which I've mentioned on another of a number of things. So everything is low flow fixtures for the most part, variable frequency drives, um, high efficient boilers, controls, et cetera. And that's really how we get down to that $1.14 um, square foot. The one thing I will highlight is on that lower right, there are still some building envelopes, some windows where the seals are broken. I, I think um, there's just, a, or the flashing on the roof. Sorry, that was what that picture of. And that was a potential for water damage. So moving on, and, and the best the best for last or the worst for last, I guess you could say. Um, I heard this mentioned uh, already, Commissioner Biggs, is the county jail. So we did go there. We looked at that. Um, and again, now this we expect to be a little higher because it is a 24-hour facility, as Dan mentioned, but it is all the way up to just shy, you know, $4.48 per square foot, which is incredibly high. Um, it, it really is. So. Again, from here, you'll see similar themes. The boilers, um, very old, I want to say 23, 20, 22 years old, um, just inefficient uh, over time. The technology was different, and as time progresses, they lose their efficiency. So we would look at the boilers. Again, the automation system, the controls throughout the entire building are old. Um, the HVAC balancing the water and the air Again, there's some opportunity for indoor air quality improvements, um, optimizing and modernizing the air handler units. They're all, uh, again, original. I think almost everything in the jail is original. So it is all around 22 years old. Um, complete LED lighting upgrade and control significant opportunity for savings there. Building envelope, again, windows, doors, lights, um, Really, there's a lot of opportunity. That's where I say the best for the last four savings um, and the prison aspect, as well as, again, the transformers and water conservation. And just a few of the pictures, again, you can see the old lighting. You can see patch jobs on the roof. Uh, there's quite a bit of, of leakage, I understand, um, as well as even the skylight right there. You can see on the lower right, it's completely cracked. Water is coming in. The, the you know faucets are old there's no low flow again controls um there's just a lot of opportunity for savings uh, and good upgrades to that in me mechanical equipment all the way around can i ask you a question of course <laughs> we know in conversations with the architect and so forth that you need very specialized equipment that's more durable for jails absolutely um, does that sort of low flow and all that sort of kind of you know preferred do they do you have a version that's for jails also? we do absolutely and I, I don't know if Dan wants to speak a lot about it but there are specific even from a lighting perspective um, there are different lighting requirements for prisons there are different water requirements um, so absolutely as we do a project and go into full development um, everything will be specified for the environment of a prison absolutely So. 
So those are all the, the buildings we've, we've looked at. And here's kind of a summary of what we've put together, um, our utility profile. So you can see all of the buildings are listed, their gross square foot, what your annual utility spend is, and then we break that down to a cost per square foot. Um, so overall, these seven buildings, the county is at $3.37 a square foot. Um, we would target $2.40 a square foot at a um, first pass, essentially, without really going into the development. And what does that mean, right? It, it is $382,000 approximately per year, 29% savings of your current utilities. Um, I believe we are being uh, conservative on some of these. I think we're going to get more on some buildings. I, I really do as we uh, hopefully dive into full development. Um, and if we go to the next slide, you'll see really, again, I mentioned early on that, that funding aspect and, and where we get there. Another thing I want to show is when we move into that, I know very early on, Daniel, you and I talked about a, the need for um, you know, understanding exactly what the county has from its assets and kind of the risk or the exposure potential over time. So we do a capital planning to tool or a capital volatility analysis. So we actually go through, we get every asset, um, the manufacturer, the model, the serial number, when it was installed, um, exactly what that consumption is, the use, useful life expectancy, and really important, we grade every single one of them. And when we come with our development, um, we put the recommendations on which one we would, uh, we would replace, exactly what we would replace it with. Um, and then you get your, your assets and what your exposure is, zero to five years, six to 10 years, 11 to five. So it really enables the county to plan better for the future ultimately. And what is that potential risk? So that's something. You basically, for each asset, you would project its life, uh, its life expectancy, and its expected year of uh, replacement need or some sort of maintenance need. Yes. Yep. And I know Barb, you had mentioned that too. That that was something that you guys were looking at an initiative for the county. So that is, you know, as we go through development, we do that through our development process. So and here's when we look at all of that. Um, so you can see. You know, in the pie chart I mentioned earlier, the kind of where the, the buckets, so to speak, for funding a project like this. Um, we've identified that 382, approximate $382,000 of energy on an annual basis and today's dollars without escalation, et cetera. Um, and I think, again, very conservative. We put probably 30,000 just for kind of the maintenance and operations. Um, and that's whether it's, it's labor, it's repair parts, things of that nature. Um, and again, I think that's very conservative. But if we look at those numbers and we do a 20 year term and escalate that, um, we have you know $13.6 million approximately of an estimated savings over 20 years. And we did do, a, I believe, a 5% escalation on that. So even that escalation is below the current market conditions. So there's some pretty significant funding, ultimately, is what we're saying, where when we look at the, the projects a different way um, and leveraging the energy, leveraging those current assets and the utility savings and the maintenance and operational savings, it can ultimately create a self-funding project. Well, thank you. Very informative. I mean, it's. If you, you're in and out of these buildings as much as you know, you know that many of us are. Is that I mean, it's, uh, some of it's obvious. Uh, you, you don't have to be an architect or an engineer or HVAC technician to, to understand that. I mean, the question the question if it is as you so well pointed out. I mean, every day these buildings are costing us more to operate than they should be costing us. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is, how do we do it? Uh, you touched on that. Um, you know, how do we how do we how do we address without you know dipping into money that we may not have? Well, address I, it. I, I I love the question, and I believe we have sent over what we would call a, a MDA or a master development agreement, and so the way we've structured that for 
the county is there is a development fee. However, um, that development fee, we don't ask for that until um, we would go in good faith and develop this project. We would develop a scope and make recommendations um, with everything, and we would deliver a proposal to the commission. Um, if the commission chooses to move forward, we ultimately, that development fee is a part of that project. So the only time that development fee even comes into question, so to speak, would be if we present everything to you, we give you the options, we give you the proposals, and you say thank you, but no thanks. Um, so we, are, we would actually development in good faith, and we are not asking for money up front. So we did send that over um, for you guys to review. Is that something that has been given to you, Scott? I have not seen that. Okay. But you need, we need to get him a copy and let him look at it. And then um, go from there, I guess. Yeah, excellent. I mean, it's, again, it's, um, there's no doubt it's going to cost us money to move on this stuff. Um, but it's, it has to be done. I mean, there's just some some stuff that it's not going to. It, it does, and that's I, I think again, I JDC the Memorial Opera House and, and a few of the buildings. Well, I guess my, but before I review it, it, I don't know why we would be doing MOH at this point, mm -hmm. and I don't know why we'd be doing the jail at this point. So I think we would need to look at an agreement that took those two out. Do we not want to keep the jail in in it? No, I think that they, if you read that, that study by Skillman is, he's still here, that it, it, it gets into the mechanicals and everything that you guys have brought up, you guys looked at. I mean, they're aware of it. I mean, it's, it, 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 again, it's just, it's, it's just an issue of, you know, how much do you want to spend? I think, so I'll just, for the prison, for example, I think one of the, the, again, I, I think an opportunity from us looking at it now is it doesn't take away from the scope of if you, you know, move forward with something else in two, three years. I think the, the opportunity is to get the energy savings now and some of it, and it's not going to change what's done in, in two, three years. It's just getting it done now so you capitalize on those savings for the next two, three years before rather than waiting, so to speak. My, my only apprehension would be since we don't, we know we're doing something at the jail, but we don't sure. know what it is yet, yeah. it's hard to say let's go replace the HVAC and the water heaters and the, some of that's the reason why it's a project to right. begin with. The roof, HVAC, water heaters, they are making the right point. I mean, they're spot on. And if we didn't have a jail project in the, on the horizon, I think it would be make a lot of sense. No, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, the same with the the Memorial Opera House. Um, but but these like, I, like JDC is a perfect building. Yeah. To, to take a look at and see what we you know see what yeah, the JDC looks like. this building, um, 157 Franklin courthouse. The courthouse. Um, I think we can start moving forward to you know determine whether or not we're going to we're we're going to commit to this. So we okay. can, I'll have Scott look at the agreement. Perfect. And the proposal. And um, we'll uh, call you back when we're ready to. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other matter which may uh, properly uh, come before the commissioners? How you doing, Don? Great. I just have some questions. Yep. I actually have two topics that I wanted to touch on. I guess I'll touch on the MOH first. Perfect. Um, actually, when was the last time the sheriff's residence had been renovated? It never turned on. I don't think the sheriff's residence has ever been renovated. Okay. And we vacated um, that building back Because before the museum the moved in there, there was a renovation. What's that? So I'm sorry. Before the museum had taken over. Mm -hmm. There was a renovation, so I was just curious. There, you're um, saying there come, was a renovation? Yes. Um, and, yeah, I'm not aware of it. Um, how come the museum was moved out of that building to the Astrum Gray, the old? 
I Ashton Gray. I wasn't. I don't know. I wasn't part of that conversation. Okay. Um, when Skillman uh, Schmidt Builders came up here, they were talking about the exterior work, um, but they didn't give the amount. What the is amount he looking at as far what? as like the, the masonry and all that, the outside work? Uh, the amount of what the bid is, or the amount for them to to do the bid package? To do the to do the exterior work, uh, the masonry that's work. We're that's why we're putting it out to bid. That tells us. Yeah, they're going to put together the bid package, and then we put it out to bid, and then the bids come back, and at that point in time, we're then we know. Then we know. Because honestly, honestly, uh, if Skillman were here, or or any one of the commissioners could tell you, could give you a figure, Don. We don't know. And by the way, Don, if you send me an email, I can send you the range that Skillman said for each of those components of the exterior work. But all it is is a range at this point. And because none of it's been bid out, we really don't know what the actual. It, it just kind of bothered me when it said that it could go above, like this five million dollars. All this project could I actually go right. So that, that kind of concerns me. I'm not, I'm not an architect and engineer, but the reason I said that I've been, you know, if you're around this stuff a long time, you you see this stuff. But uh, we, as I just touched on, nobody really knows until you get that information back. And, and to, to, you know, just to be as openly and transparent with the public as possible, I'm saying it is not out of the, uh, out of the possibility for that to come back at a, at a larger cost than what we currently have targeted to address it. So then what happens then? Uh, you know, that, that's a financial one. That's really a question that the, the, the county council needs to answer. The commissioners are bringing them a building that we know, that we own, that we know needs repair. We're, we're currently allowing public in and out of it. We're currently operating a theater operation. And as we just talked about, uh, from my understanding, now there's, they're doing some kind of children's programming in it as well. So it, it is, you know, it is absolutely necessary for us, if we're going to continue to do that, to fix what's broken over there. I agree with you. But the, the issue that I have, I guess, is the sheriffs, the old uh, sheriff's residents. I'm kind of leaning towards changing my opinion as why not have the, you know, upgrade. The extension? The extension. Why not do that money. now? I mean, if, if, you're, if you're taking a separate project and you're going to be putting another $120,000 in to the sheriff's residence, why not that just renters, go with the other proposal? That renters would pay for it. That what? That the renters, renters would, would pay, pay for, for that for that right. uh, improvement. Currently, we have a building sitting there for over three years that, that is just wasting away. Well, that's why I was wondering how come the museum was actually moved out of the building. I have no idea. For all I know, they want it out of there. They, they paid a lot of money to renovate that building. They did so. want it out of there. It's not climate controlled. There's a lot of the same kind of problems that we saw with these other buildings. And the artifacts don't keep well. Um, so they wanted to get out. And they wanted to get into a business model that would allow them to travel around the county more and have more pop-ups. And they're, they're right across the street now is their main base. And it has way more uh, you know it's got HVAC I and mean, that building didn't even have air conditioning and as Barb pointed out they're still occupying they're still a, a some square footage in there the way in the back they're, they're holding the jail <coughs> the old jail portion not the sheriff's residence part but and they plan to do guided tours well I'm, I'm just surprised that it got moved from that building to where Astor and Gray used to be because if that building wasn't big enough, because it, it, at one point that's what was stated, that it was not big enough. How was the building that they moved it to big enough to hold the artifacts that, you know, I saw, I never you know, heard behind curtains? I looking for a larger space. What's that? I always heard it was about climate control. I oh, okay. I'm looking for a larger space. Okay, I, I was, uh, miss, uh, uh, You know, the thing is, Don, had, had, had they not moved out, you know, they've been in there right now. I mean, very well would be sitting in that audience saying, thank God something finally is going to get done. Because it's either, you either, our choices is either to renovate 
and add on to the Memorial Opera House, which which the old jail, uh, sheriff's residence was part of that. That that price tag is going to be somewhere up around nine million dollars. We already know that, uh, and it could be higher. Or but the same as could be said with what you're getting ready to do with fixing the MOH. You, I mean. You guys said it. It could go up and beyond the five million dollars. So why not? Why not just do what the the proposed plan was? Well, hypothetical. Well, because it, there's. I mean, of, I'm just saying we're. If 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 just fixing the Memorial Opera House is more than five million, can you imagine what extending it, the square footage in it, connecting it, you know, building the connector and all that, what it would be? You know, it's it, the issue here is not. And I'll speak for myself. I never disliked the actual connector, looking at it from uh, the schematic drawings that I saw. That was beautiful. My, my issue from day one has always been, been about the expense. When I look at other buildings in our inventory that we're responsible for, why are you going to spend all this money outside of just fixing what's wrong with that main building before you're, you're doing anything with things like the garage or the jail or the JDC center or this building. We just sat here with a presentation and found, you know, we, uh, almost all of our buildings, with the exception of a couple, you know, we're, you know, we're running very expensively. So why, why, how do I explain that to the taxpayers that we're going to, we're going to put in, you know, could be nine, ten million dollars into a project that we don't deliver any of our services out of before we give any attention to what else we're responsible for. I don't know how I sell that. I don't. How, how do we sell the idea of taking the people from the MOH and putting them in the courthouse and doing whatever little renovations that needs to be done there? I mean, just curious, would it not make reason, sense for them to be in the building next door? The reason that we, um, suggested the courthouse is because that space will be ready sometime this summer and if we are able to start those renovations they're going to need a place where it's quiet and it's not dusty the renovations of the um, sheriff's residence aren't going to be done until theoretically the end of the year they're going to need a place to to be during the renovations so it doesn't make sense for them to go into the sheriff's residence it's not cool there's no air conditioning in there and they don't have a lot of visitors, so the fact that you know people coming to visit them at the courthouse that's not really an issue. So it's a it's a perfect the, the amount upstairs, of space for them. The upstairs of that building is huge. We're gonna we're gonna occupy an entire level of a, of a building of that size for two people, three people. No, that's not smart. Well, we'd have to move walls around. We have to correct. We'd have to build walls. But are you actually going to be doing that at no. some point? I mean, not if at you're going to be not at this point. Not at this point, because there was a, a proposal for 120,000 for the lower, correct. and then 150,000 for if the we upper. Did, if we did all of it, it would be 150,000. But we're only going to do the first floor. We're only going to do the main level for 120. And I understand that, but what, what he was saying is we'd have to move walls and this and that. And, and at some point, you're going to be doing that anyway. I mean, if you're going to be advertising no to lease the building. No idea what we're going to be building. doing at some point in time in the future with that. We don't well, know. We don't know. That's a doing. fair statement. I don't disagree with it. But everything's about a priority. Yeah. Does it need to be done? Yeah. Should it jump in front of everything else that we need to do at this point? No. Absolutely well, not. my opinion is the five million dollars could be used for something much greater than this. Obviously, you, I've said that many a times. And you can make that argument. And I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm not. I, we have that building. That building, as long as we're going to operate out of it and allow the public inside of it, whether they're paying to get in it or not, we have to make sure that it's in in, in good repair. I agree. There's a there's a there's a huge degree of liability that we take on if we don't, and we already know what's wrong with it. We've already been told, you know, a dozen times what's wrong with it. So it is, it is, it is our responsibility at that, that point to do one or two things: either move forward to getting it fixed, or move everybody out of it and closing it. What were the plans to get it fixed, monetarily wise, before the ARPA money came in? We didn't have a funding source yet. That was part of the 
part of the issue. So that's where it, it, it seems just, you know, really hard to take. When this was proposed in 2018, I believe? Originally, I believe. I mean, that was the original story. And, I mean, there was, was there never any, I mean, I know there's a foundation, mm -hmm. and, I mean, are there, there's no way to get grants, there's no way to get donations. I mean, I've looked all of this stuff up. I know there is, so I'm just. Well, we have applied for a grant. You what? We have applied for a grant. I, I'm, I was talking about, you know, the ARPA money, how you were going to fund this project before the ARPA money became available. Well, you know, look, I mean, I see, I see your point there, okay? Is there other things we could be using $5 million on? And, and the answer to that is yes. Yes, there are. But again, we have a building there that has a lot of activity going on it, a lot of public going in and out of it that has to be fixed. We need, we're, we've come to a fork in a road. We're either going to sit there and pontificate on spending another four or five million dollars on a build out uh, uh, and using money that we really don't have, have to use uh, because of other responsibilities that we have on. Are we going to, or we, do we close it? I, like I said, my opinion has changed. Do the build out. Because if we're putting all this money and then you're going to do all this other work to that uh, sheriff's residence anyway, why not? not why not? Why not? Because we're, it's, it's we're hardly done. doing anything to the sheriff's residence. Don, that's, that's silly. I don't mean that in, to be insult you. It's, that's a silly stance to take. I don't feel it is silly. I feel well, that. I well, feel a, that. A large, I, I feel there's that. There's a big difference between $5 million and $9.5 million. And I understand that. The $5 million should have never came into play. So my point is, since your, your guy that just was sitting up here, uh, Schmidt Builders, is saying that this out, just, just the exterior work, the masonry, could be over $5 million. No, 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 no. Dawn, I will send you, okay. send me an email, and I'll send you the range for all of the different things that were agreed upon. So if it were. does go above, what then? Then it, well, well that's the a, bids that's, come back, the bids come back to us, and at that point in time, we have to vote the commissioners or not vote need to, to accept have it, them. The commissioners need to discuss that. The council needs to consider that. Because at the end of the day, the council is the one who's going to decide, because of the work that we've done up to this point, whether that's going to get renovated or not. Not the Board of Commissioners. The Board of Commissioners are sending that project to them to renovate. They will decide whether or not they want to renovate it. And, you know, when I was here during the last Commissioner and Porter County Council meeting, there was um, on the agenda on the Porter County Council, <laughs> $90,000, this is separate from the $5 million for the HAVAC, for the MOH. Okay. And I had spoke to you as you were out here, and you said they have no air. Well, I went there. Um, <coughs> I, I believe it was Memorial Day. I kind of walked I, I in because there they had think, an event going I on. I think I can make Excuse me, can I finish, sense. please? There was an event going on. I walked in. People were, you know, leaving. It, it was comfortable. I did fixed. go inside. It got fixed on. Okay, fixed. well. Did. The reason the $90,000 was on the council agenda is because we were in a meeting and we were informed that there was an emergency need, that there was no air. It happened to be the day that the deadline was to get something on the council agenda. Without any other information at hand, we asked that for that to be on the council agenda. So it was on the council agenda. In the meantime, Daniel had some time to research and get people over there and to see what they could do to fix that to the best of their ability. And they did. So we have a new lease on life for two seasons, he believes. So My other thing was I, I did walk in, and I did go into the women's bathroom. I did see the handicapped stall. I mean, yeah, the bathroom was small. But I did see the handicapped uh, stall. And, you know, when Greg Sims gave the sob story that, you know, an elderly lady could not get her wheelchair in there, shouldn't that have been addressed a long time ago? If this is an issue with the ADA, I mean, if somebody can't, if it's not wheelchair accessible, shouldn't that have been something that should have been addressed a long time ago? Because, I mean, should. for over an hour and 20 minutes, you guys fought for over a bathroom. Five million dollars, and it was a fight about a bathroom. So I mean, the ADA. I was just curious about that. 
the bathrooms, the need for the bathrooms. And we disagree about this, but that's why we wanted to do the connector. So we had somewhere to put new, bigger, ADA accessible bathrooms. They just don't work in that kind of space. We did. And the whole project kind of, it's a domino effect. You move the bathrooms out, you put the bar in there, you put the box office, it changes everything. So we, now that we're not using the bathrooms, we're kind of stuck in that space. We did have a proposal to add restrooms, additional restrooms, ADA accessible restrooms. That you two decided you didn't have to do. Unfortunately, that added potentially $2 million to the proposal, which kicked that dollar amount above $5 million to close to $7 million. And we don't have more than $5 million available in the art Didn't plans. someone say that they were actually going to kick in that $2 million? No. Was it there a foundation? The foundation did if we were doing the entire expansion, but they didn't want to do it. And they wanted five years to collect the money. And that, that, that opens up a whole can of, uh, again, that it, uh, on, on its cover, it looks great. You know, it will be $2 million. I, but I can tell you right now, there's no foundation around that's going to give us $2 million for that money that is not going to want some kind of an agreement from us, memorandum of understanding of what they now can do. Who's going to hand us $2 million without, you know? They said they would. Okay. Well, the other thing that bothered me was that the MOH never went in front of the, any of the committees, just like everyone else that came up for the ARPA funds. They never did come up in front of, you know, anyone. So that, that was just something else that bothered me. My other point, real quick, it is on uh, the SB4. Um, I, just, I just wanted to ask a question. For the commissioners, um, how can you guys guarantee these funds uh, to be used in a responsible manner? From what was presented at the health board meeting, there are only ideas of how to spend SB4 money and that is not a responsible way to handle over 4.5 million dollars of taxpayer money also what a disappointment in a health board to endorse attaining more than quadruple the money without a plan in place of how to spend it can you do an ordinance or something to approve the plans of how the money is spent if we opt in as a county which i hope we don't well that's Quite honestly, that's why the county council exists. They they are the fiduciary body, fiduciary body of county government, and that budget, like any budget that they've had, will has to has to come up in front of them. They review it and they decide what they're going to allow them to spend and where. That, so, are are you guys leaning towards opting in then? We don't know. We haven't had any presentation here yet, so we okay. will. I have qu I have quite uh, Barb. I don't. I don't. I mean, I don't mind telling you. Yes, I am. Yes, I am leaning toward it. Why? Because it's 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 a lot of money that can make a lot of difference. And you just if, mentioned if, though, if it's managed properly. But you just mentioned about strings attached. Wouldn't you think that this would have something with strings attached? I'm as smart as anything down there that passed that bill. So I ain't worried about me signing on to something. There's going to be strings attached. that's going to uh, handcuff uh, county taxpayers in the future i'll make sure of that i ain't worried about that but i yes i am leaning toward it because again i think there it has the opportunity to do a lot of good if it's managed properly and i have a i have a couple of questions one is very quickly one is what happens if if because when all this is rolled out the term surplus was used these are surplus funds they're not surplus funds. okay she says uh commissioner blaney says they're not i feel a little better about that Okay, so we get confirmation on that, that, it, that they're not going to go away. Uh, the the, the uh, second uh, uh, issue I have is that we don't build something that is, is, then becomes a burden to the rest of co county government. Because you cannot, if you work in government, and whether it's town, city, or it doesn't take you very long to understand. If you quintuple somebody's uh, a, a, a agency's budget, it is not going to look the same in 24 to 36 months. It's just not, unless you're giving all the money away. So we have to be prepared what we're willing to take on at that point. Because the unmitigated truth is, legislation created that money to be given to us. 
By the federal government. No, by the state, state. government. Okay, state yeah. government. But, the, Either but one. the state government can create legislation to take it away. It can. So then why not wait to opt in? See what happens with the other counties that have opted in. I mean, we did that with the opioid. Well, because I, don't, I, I look, we have a lot of smart people that work here, a lot of intelligent people. I don't need to find out, watch other counties do their thing while we sit back and, and you know, I don't, we don't need to do that. If we do our work here, it, it, you know, this, this will be a boon to us, a boon to our residents. If we don't do our work here, it'll end up being a huge mistake. And if it is a huge mistake when we opt in, who gets the responsibility? Who's going to That's take the responsibility for that? That's why they have elections. The, the, well, the, the, the onus is on the elected officials. It's on the Board of Commissioners and the County Council. But I mean, that doesn't really help those of us that, you know, are not elected. I wish I had a better answer, Don, but it's just, it is. It's our fault. It's our fault. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, my name is Johannes Pilar. Uh, uh, yes, my name is Johannes Poulard, and I ran for Indiana State Senate last year uh, in the Republican primary, and I plan to run again um, uh, in 2026. And I have a huge concern about SB4 because I've been researching this law, and I've been working together with Ashley Grog, who uh, runs Hoosiers for Medical Liberty. And... What happens when the counties opt into SB4? You lose the local control of the health department and it merges with the state. This to me is very disturbing because I've seen a lot of things going on with COVID, which is what got me involved politically. Um, first of all, the one thing that really disturbed me when all of this started was I'm one of those kids that drove the teachers up the wall because I always learned above my grade level. When I was in sixth grade, I read pre-med and college level books on virology and epidemiology because the subject interested me. And uh, of course, being brought up by two college professors with PhDs, my parents always in, uh, encouraged me to, to do that. But my teachers, for some reason, never wanted me to learn above my grade level. And I didn't figure out why until COVID. Then when I started seeing the news and they're telling me that uh, you can catch the, you can spread the disease when you're asymptomatic and when the books on virology said the opposite, I'm like, wait a minute here. There's something wrong with that picture. And so when I looked at what, what they wanted to do and I look, and on top of that, there was a lot of opposition in the state of Indiana against SB4. Uh, we had people calling the uh, Senate and the House of Representatives. And then there was, there was a collusion between the Governor Eric Holcomb and House Speaker Todd Houston and Senate President Roderick Bray. They decided to vote for the bill behind closed doors, not allowing anybody to testify knowing the opposition in the state. So you might want to take serious look at this bill before, it, uh, before you, you uh, think about passing it because it could be a serious threat to our liberties. And once I do get elected, I will uh, draft legislation to repeal SB4 at the state level because I'm really concerned about our medical liberties. I, you know, I'm against the COVID vaccine because of all the health problems it causes. Even my dad had health problems when he got it. Um, I was very against the mask mandate and all these other mandates. The lockdowns destroyed 40% of Indiana's small business, including mine. Um, and so I would say just take a serious look and think twice before you ratify this because this could be uh, really hurting our liberties. I'm curious. Uh who won your election? Uh, Jeff Larson did, but I got 20% of the vote, which is not bad for the first time. And then Jeff lost to? To uh, Senator Pohl. Yes. Yep. But uh, Senator Pohl voted for this, this bill. 
I know he did. And uh, his uh, assistant, Tyler, said he wasn't going to vote for it. Then I checked the voting record. And yeah, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of fear and skepticism that, that has been created. Rightfully so. Over the last three or four years, uh, with rightfully the so. And, and, yeah, and if especially if you work in it, you understand it. I've and that's why it is it is really incumbent on, on us to very carefully consider would, this. And if we do move and fo move forward with it. That we that we don't let go of it, uh, right? And and continue to hang on to it and manage it very carefully. And one of the reasons why I came to this mission, to this to this commissioners meeting, was because Northern Porter Porter County is part of District Four. It's actually a large part of District Four. The part of Laporte County where I live in is a small part of District yeah. Four. But you know, since I'd be representing the whole district if I do win, uh, it's kind of would be in my interest well, that's to see a, what that's a big office for. to take on the first time out of the gates maybe maybe you need to consider something a little smaller first get your feet wet yeah because you see you seem like you got your heart in the right place i don't know it was it was my calling and uh i don't intend to be it be in there long i just intend to be there to correct things that need to be corrected mm -hmm. i'm very against all the corruption that i've discovered was going on well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's nice meeting you. Yeah, thank you. It was nice meeting you. Come by again. I sure will. Take care. You too. Receive the best for last. Is that it, <laughs> Sylvia? I don't know, but Dawn, my hat is off to you, hearing you speak today. Uh, my name is Sylvia Graham. I live at 178 West, 150 North, Valparaiso, Indiana. I'm a longtime Porter County resident. Uh, 15 years on the Porter County Council and uh, a total of 38 years in the health field as a family as a RN and a family nurse practitioner as you know uh, Senator Charbonneau our senator in this area wrote the bill I don't think it, it was passed by uh, a Republican controlled Senate and the House I have faith in it I I feel that there is much that we can gain as a county by opting in. And I appreciate you saying that you're, you're willing to listen. And um, I think that the Board of Health has asked you to please opt in. The, the Porter County Health Department has said they need the money to develop a equipment to get data and a plan. From what I heard the other day, uh, part of their problem is they want to give, they want to pre create a grant program, or like you say, if they can give away some of the money to other nonprofits, or even to county uh, things, such as people that are hit with high cost of uh, septic systems that suddenly fail or go out, they're they're hit with a thirty-five thousand dollar bill, and that's hard for most people to handle on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so I feel like there's a, a big advantage uh, that we need to look at and uh, I would, I'm for it. I strongly urge you to uh, listen to it and to opt in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Sylvia. Anybody else? Hello, state your name, Hi. please. Kelly Ziglitz. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Um, I just had a couple questions and concerns uh, regarding SB4. So um, I was at the health board meeting where the health board approved SB4 um, just last week. And my biggest concern is the lack of statistics to make recommendations. I feel like you should have the data first for Porter County specifically before you make recommendations with so much money. And I feel like the recommendations have already been made, they've already been thought out, but there's nothing to, to show or correlate like a cause and effect to me. I didn't see anything presented like that, which I was disappointed to see from a health board. So that is my biggest concern. I want to know why. I want to know, there was a lot about obesity, smoking cessation, things like that. Okay, 
what are the causes? I want to know the underlying causes. What, you know, there was nothing discussed on that level, like the why. So that is another thing that um, I feel like we should have. Um, there has to be some kind of statistics somewhere. <laughs> so do we, do you know that? <laughs> If we have those kinds of statistics for Porter uh, County, yeah, you know, I'm not aware. But it's one of it's one of those things that I, I spoke about earlier. Is mm -hmm. that look, you don't once you get to, once you approve this, if it's going to be approved, you don't mm -hmm. let go of it. You 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 set high expectations amongst those who are managing these programs and and and, and this money is and and it's, it's going to be important for the board of commissioners to say you know to, for us to explain the three of us what those expectations are. The same with the county council. You know, the, the other advantage, I mean, we can opt out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the word you used the other day? Uh, provisional. Provisional. Okay. This ain't, just voting for this doesn't mean it's forever. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake about that. Okay. It's that, yeah, we're going to, we're going to weigh in on this and because it looks like it can be something really beneficial for our residents. Mm -hmm. But that's all going to depend on the on us, on how, how closely we monitor it, the county council, and 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 the the management in the in the health department. It, it, if you're not doing that, if we're not all doing our job, this whole thing could spin out of out of control very quickly. Yeah. To where you you wake up one morning and all we have is something bigger than what we got downstairs. Mm -hmm. That's 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 not allowed to. That it's really not any more beneficial than it's already being without that money right i mean it's it, it, more money you know more people more space for those people to work out of you know we're all we're service oriented 99.9 percent .9 of what we do is not done is done by human beings it's not done by a machine so you know if if we're we intend to if we think we're going to take that money spend it on us that could be a huge huge problem because us means more employees, more space. Within two years or less, they'd be, they'd have to move out of this building. We'd have to find a new building or build one for them. I don't think that's what the people want. I don't think the state of Indiana, that's what they had in mind. I think what they, they want us to do is to take those, those funds and work with, you know, neighboring agencies and, and to, to really understand what's, what's causing the problem as you just touched on, mm -hmm. it's we hell. We all know what the pro We all know there's a problem. Mm -hmm. What's causing that? Right. That's we, what I want to know. <laughs> we have a certain kind of cancer here in Northwest Indiana. Mm -hmm. We know that there there's a high content of, of iron in the the wildlife that that is tested throughout Northwest Indiana. They they we have problems with the air. We have we have accidental dumps into the tributaries or Lake Michigan itself, where many of us get our water. How how do we how do we stop that sort of thing or figure out what's really causing it all? That's where that money could really be could really be beneficial to us. We know we got a problem. Right. Well, I don't I don't need to spend more money to figure out we got a problem. Right. <laughs> we, we have we have we have we have to it has to be smartly very smartly spent. And quite honestly, I am really surprised that the state has not put more restrictions on it. Now that's not to say that a year from now there may not there may be more restrictions on it moving forward. So they can add restrictions once you accept it. Well, sure they can. It's it's, it's by state law, absolutely they can. That's why it's concerning. <laughs> well, it's look again. That's why we hold elections here. If me or anybody else sitting up here, or anybody on the county council, is wanting to let the state of Indiana or any other uh, any other governmental agency come in here and run things for us. Then that's our fault. Right. We need to be taken out of our our seats of responsibility. If we do our job, and I don't, I have not read anything. And I know there's going to be a lot of people disagree with me. I have not read anything in that bill that makes me believe that. I just, I just don't see it. There is a clear opt out of this. Clear. But once you're in, they can add restrictions. Well, certain, certainly. I mean, truthfully, yes, yes, they can write. They can go any year they're down there. They can write a bill that adds more restrictions out of the money spent. Is that? There is would it? be a political repercussion for the people that voted to do that. I think that would be very upsetting at yeah. the local level. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why this <laughs> bill doesn't look anything like it did when it was originally put in front of everybody. That they heard the, the political repercussions, and then the rewrites start. But okay, look, whether it's ten dollars or ten million dollars, how it's spent, you know, the, the, how responsible we are with spending any of it stops right here and with the county council. You don't need to blame it on state officials who, who they're down there trying to, they know we got a problem statewide, they're trying to figure it out, so they're, they're, going, to, they're going to throw money at us to, to, and actually what they're saying to us, figure it out. And if we don't figure it out, if, if throughout the state of Indiana it's not figured out, I can guarantee you that money's not going to keep coming. Um, are you going to be having a public hearing prior to the day you're voting on it on July 24th? No, I, uh, uh, no, I, I don't. I mean, I'm only one person here. The only thing this seat gives me is the right to run this meeting. I don't make all the decisions, though. I, I, you know, we'll, we're going to dedicate that meeting to that issue. Okay. It's not going to compete with something else like we, we've had here today. And we've all had plenty of time to look at this. Um, we've had, you know, we've had a, two or three months now. And we've got another month in front of us that we can take a look at it. If we're not ready on the, on the 14th, I don't know if we'll ever be ready. 20, 24th. 24th? 24th. Yeah, the 24th. Okay. Um, I guess, my, again, I go back to my biggest concern, which is, there's nothing it, at the health board meeting that was brought up how we've been doing so far on our health initi health initiatives, how we performed, nothing. I, I, I just, I feel like Kelly, I, it's yeah, a big I, bill. I for, don't disagree. Yeah. I, I was stunned to see that they yeah. voted when they had only a, th a third of their, their board wasn't there, wasn't present. Right. I was shocked That's that they would do something like that. Concern. With a, with a pro with a, with, you know, with an issue of this size and scope. That can't be, you know, that board is not there for window dressing. Those seven people, they're not engineers, they're not plumbers. They all have medical backgrounds or admi medical administrative backgrounds. They're there for a reason. And they need, to, they need to be right from the very beginning of planning, the pr programming of how that money is going to be spent. They have to play a, a pivotal role. I could make a case they should be paying the primary role and not the, not, not the management. That's why they are there. They're there. They're not created there, uh, by ordinance. That is a state law that that board exists. And the people on that board need to wake up to that. They've taken on a lot of responsibility, and they need to flex their muscle. They have, but I was very disappointed in the PowerPoint presentation. I don't feel like I feel like there should have been more information and. Like what have I we what have we been doing then if we don't have like basic it. statistics on things? Well, we haven't had the money. I mean, it costs a lot of money to do studies and, and get those kind of statistics. I mean, we're spending. 12, but we have the 50. COVID cases coming in every day, every second um, on the TV for our county and everything. Like, I just feel like if it matters, then it it should be there. We should have that information. Well. From my understanding, you need to. And we're going to get. We're going to really get into the weeds on this on the 24th. Is that what they approved the other night was that they approved. They want to accept it. There, they, there wasn't a. The plan wasn't approved. The plan has not been formulated yet. Right. And that needs to be made clear to everybody. So will the plan be presented then on the 24th? No, no. So we still, okay, but we're going to vote for it and then talk about the plan. Yes. That seems kind of. Well. Uh, yeah, well, you can make it. I'm not going to argue with it. it. You can make a case <laughs> that that's sort of like backing into the garage. I get it. Yeah. I get it. But it's it's the the cards we were dealt with. We can either say no to to it this year, and and then formulate you know have them formulate a plan and then bring it for uh, forward to the board of commissioners and the county council for them to approve to opt into it the next year. Or we can have two million dollars to do some yeah. studies and get the answers to the questions. Kelly, Kelly just, I, I feel like that's a good point. Like, for, like, can we, like, like you said, it doesn't have to be black and white, right? right. We can have some kind of limitations, come to some kind right. of agreement. Right. So why can't we just get that, 
the percentage towards the data first, get the data we need to make the right recommendations, like slow down the, the carriage a little bit. You know what I mean? Before it goes out of control making recommendations that don't make sense where we could get later on you know, more provisions added to us and get, no, I can't think of any better word, but get screwed later on, you know? Well, you got to remember but, that when that, that money comes into county government, yeah, it is, it is automatically managed by the county council. That the county council, you know, if they come up in front of the council and say, hey, we'd like to take $300,000 of this money and put it toward that effort. Mm -hmm. And the, con you know, four members of the council go, what, what? No. It just makes just because we have right. it don't mean it gets spent. <clears throat> right. Right. Well, it just makes like you said, it makes I think you agree. It makes more sense to have a plan and have the numbers first, the statistics of the actual causes which we don't have right now. I keep asking for it and it's nowhere. So, I feel like we need that data first before we can present a solution that makes sense for us. So, can we, like maybe we can just a suggestion well, fraction off a percentage of that, maybe not the whole package, just a fraction, and get the data first so we can make the right recommendations. You know what? The county council could very well do that if okay. they choo choose to do. Say, well, you know, we're only releasing this amount for you to collect the data that we need to, to release the rest. I, they could, so that's they all could, on the county they could, council. Well, they are, they are they hold the purse strings. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Well, Kelly, Thank you. the other thing, too, is I would suggest that you, if it sounds like this is something you're really passionate about, I would continue attending the health board meetings and reaching out to the health board itself mm -hmm. and, and just making your recommendations known to them. I have been very vocal, and thank you. Um, I feel like certain, it, it just, you know, it seems like, <laughs> it seems like, um, certain people are willing to help on the health board so I will continue to do that but um, it you know like you said with the purse strings it looks like the money part it goes through the county council so I'll continue to do that as well thank you but well like I said well we're going to do a deep dive on this on the 24th so I, and I encourage you to show up and, and yes. ask your question because I I'm you asked some pretty good questions and I want to I want to hear out of the health department how they plan on well I'm hoping the board will attend also I'm hoping so too. <laughs> so we can Thanks. see what they're thinking. So. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. That was a marathon meeting. Starving. Thank you. Have a nice day. What's left of it?